Good morning, everyone. Before I get into the business of today's hearing, I'd like to uh, express my solidarity to the family and to family for safe streets and transportation alternative as we've been dealing with the last victim of crashes in New York City. Uh, something that we know even when we will defeat COVID-19, the level of crashes in the city of New York is an epidemic that must bring all of us to also commit to defeat it. More than 250 last year is a big number. So I hope again that as we're gonna be speaking about protecting our city uh, on flooding in the future, but I also want to take this opportunity to invite all of us to also continue putting our ideas and initiative on how we defeat the epidemic of those crashes, hit and run, that take the life of so many beautiful individuals, such as a child that unfortunately was the last victim. Thank you all for attending today's joint oversight hearing of the Committees on Transportation, Resiliency, and Waterfront, and Environmental Protection on DOT's and MTA's resiliency effort in preparation for coastal storms. I want to first acknowledge the lives lost in the aftermath of Hurricane Ida. This hearing is about understanding what went wrong and making sure we do everything possible to prevent it from happening again in the future. These strategies make clear the reality that climate change will not affect all of us equally. Of course, our responsibility is to protect all New Yorkers or the five boroughs, but also we need to give special attention to what's going on also in the underserved community, where also we've been dealing with a lack of investment to protect them from flooding. Our planning for the future can't only focus on protecting areas like lower Manhattan from rising sea levels. It also, most of the victims of this storm were trapped in the basement level housing units in Queens. Climate change only makes more difficult the problems that we already face, like affordable housing and maintaining effective public transit. As we move forward, we had to resist the, fl the, the flooding blame for the response Hurricane Ida by talking about the unprecedented nature of this storm. Yes, it was a unprecedented nature storm, but also we were not prepared as a city, neither from the MTA perspective. Severe weather events like this one and the other flooding events we have seen in the city this summer are our new normal. In addition to improving the ways, ways that we communicate the dangers of impending storms to the most vulnerable, we need to get to work now on adapting our city for a rainier future. We have known for years about the threat our communities face from flooding we saw these dangers firsthand almost 10 years ago during Superstorm Sandy. The storm this summer proved we don't have time to wait on building a, a resilient city. That's why it is disheartening to hear that almost a decade after Sandy, some of the resiliency project that began as a result of that storm have still not been completed. We know all the city, all the nation, that we compete at the same level, that they are able to finish projects in the shorter period of time. But for example, in my district, the resiliency improvement project at the 207 Street Transit Yard in Manhattan are still ongoing. And protections at the critical Coney Island Yard are only 50% completed. 
that will not happen in another city, another state, that we compete at the same level, that we have followed the same level of procurement. This is unacceptable. We need to get project done in a short period of time. Our city was clearly not prepared for the damage caused by the heavy rain we experienced. Countless videos emerged of the flooded homes and crumbling train station that gave way to the overflow of rainwater. Being unprepared for the future storm is simple, not acceptable. We owe it to those we have suffered, who have suffered as a result of this most recent strategy to do everything we can to make sure this doesn't happen again. In today's hearing is our hope to gather as much information as possible about the current resiliency efforts above the city and state levels to fortify and protect the transit system and improve our city's infrastructure against severe weather events. Before turning over before turning over to Chairman Brennan for his opening statement, I would like to acknowledge that the following council members have joined us. Council Member Levine, Miller, Gennaro, Brennan, and Holder. Now let's, I turn it on to Chairman Brennan, Justin Brennan. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Good morning, my name is Justin Brennan. I have the privilege of chairing the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts, and I join Chair Rodriguez and Chair Gennaro in welcoming you to today's joint hearing and would also like to extend my thanks to uh, my co-chairs uh, for holding this important hearing in a timely uh, manner. Climate week is next week and if the past few months have taught us anything, it's that the climate crisis is here, uh, it's sitting right next to us and we can't hide uh, from it because time is not on our side. Flooding from rainstorms is not a new phenomenon and it affects more than just coastal areas as we saw. When Tropical Storm Elsa hit the city in July and more than five inches of rain fell in just a few hours, areas of Upper Manhattan and the West Bronx experienced significant flooding. But areas that typically flood from coastal storm events uh, like the area around the Gowanus Canal or Hamilton Beach did not flood. A month later, Tropical Storm Henri brought heavy rains and high winds. Over seven inches of rain fell over two days. And then just two weeks later, Tropical Storm Ida flooded the city and killed 13 New Yorkers, including a two-year-old boy. For the first time ever, a flash flood emergency was put in place for the five boroughs at the same time. The subways were shut down, cars floated down roadways, the sewers overflowed. The sewer system, which was built 100 years ago, was not designed for the once-in-a-lifetime storms that we now get several times a year. They were designed to handle no more than 1.5 to 2 inches of rain per hour. Two weeks ago, more than 3 inches of rain fell in one hour, almost two times the system's designed capacity. For more than 70% of the city is made up of hard services like concrete and asphalt, services that prevent water from natural infiltration into the ground. The city was not built to handle such intense rain, and flooding events don't just occur when a tropical storm hits the city. About 60% of the city is served by combined sewer systems. This means that both wastewater and stormwater are routed together to treatment plants to be processed. When these lines are full, the combined wastewater and stormwater needs to go somewhere. Just two weeks ago, that water turned streets into rivers and devastated people's homes and businesses. Unless we ensure that plants, green spaces, and pervious surfaces are just as prevalent as hardscape surfaces, the rain will continue to turn streets into rivers and flood subways, homes, and businesses. The city released its stormwater resiliency plan and stormwater uh, flood maps back in May, just before the official June 1st start of the 2021 Atlantic hurricane season. The plan and the maps are a good first step, but some of the expected completion dates are not for another two to three years. Emergency management's draft messaging to warn basement apartment dwellers about the potential dangers of extreme rain events will not be completed until 2023. 11 people died in basement apartments two weeks ago. Two years is too long to develop these notification systems. As I said, the climate crisis is here. 
The time is for discussion is over, and now it's time to prioritize and expedite shovels in the ground. We weren't prepared for these storms. Why? We know that we are going to keep seeing intense storms more frequently. We must act, and we must take a five-borough holistic approach. I look forward today to thinking forward and, and, and figuring out how uh, we are going to make sure that we learn uh, from, from this storm. Uh, New York City has always recovered uh, and, and in the face of any adversity, uh, but it's important that we recover smart and that we build back smarter and stronger and that we learn about the new fa challenges that we're facing. I look forward to hearing from the MTA and the administration during today's hearing. Uh, quickly before we begin, I want to thank my committee staff, committee counsel Jessica Steinberg-Albin, senior policy analyst Patrick Mulvihill, senior finance analyst Jonathan Seltzer, and my chief of staff Chris McCright, my senior advisor Jonathan Yedin, my legislative director Michael Sheldon, as well as the staff, the Transportation and Environmental Protection Committees, for all their hard work in putting this important hearing together in a short amount of time. I'll turn it back over now to Chair Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, next, I will turn, turn it over to Chairman Gennaro for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wish to thank you for your leadership and also Chairman Brannon. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to uh, chair a hearing with you. Good morning. My name is Jim Gennaro, Chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection. And today we're holding an important hearing on the impacts of Storm Ida and the response to the storm and the preparedness of the city and the MTA, and, and the MTA to respond to future storm events. As chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection, I'll be focusing on DEP and the capacity of the city's water infrastructure, the city's sewer infrastructure, rather, to manage stormwater. In 2008, I authored Local Law 5, which mandated that DEP and the Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability create a comprehensive stormwater management plan. That was the first law of its kind in the country at the time, and it was a pretty big deal. Uh, the development of the stormwater plan became central to Plan YC, the city's plan as it was known at the time, <clears throat> and the development and implementation of that plan notwithstanding, and as Justin said, is still being um, implemented. <clears throat> it seems that whatever cutting edge plans the city has made and actions the city has taken to manage stormwater, Ida, Ida certainly showed me that whatever additional ability the city has to manage stormwater, we need to do that and then some. Uh, recent tropical storms uh, in the city show that more stormwater management strategies will be necessary to grapple with the very severe weather and reduce the risk of flooding. As we know, Ida cost 13 New Yorkers their lives in stormwater. I believe we need to build on the good work of the city's stormwater management plan and take it to the next level. To keep up with ever more intense weather events brought on by climate change, the city needs to do better, period. This hearing begins that process. I thank the administration for his presence here today and all that DEP has done to manage stormwater. Without the stormwater management, uh, 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 stormwater management infrastructure that has been deployed and the stormwater management strategies that have been adopted, the effects of Ida would have been far worse. I also thank the committee staff who have done such great work over the years. Um, uh, EP Committee Counsel Samara Swanson, Policy Analyst Nadia Johnson, Ricky Chawla, uh, financial analyst John, Jonathan Seltzer, and finally my legislative director, uh, Nabi Cower, for all of their hard work. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it, uh, I'll turn things back to Chair Rodriguez. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I will give the opportunity to the Chairman of the Committee of uh, Sanitation, right? Antonio Reynoso, to also say a few words. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just wanted to thank uh, Commissioner Grayson and Department of Sanitation for being here. Uh, it seems like no matter what mess is put in front of us uh, related to infrastructure and um, other agency issues, uh, sanitation is always there to clean up the mess. So I just wanted to thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you, Chair, for uh, indulging me with some time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Reynolds. So I will now have our committee council call on the administration to testify and to administer the oath. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Uh, from New York City. Uh, from New York City Emergency Management, Commissioner John Scrivani. From the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency, Director Janie Bavishi. 
from the Department of Environmental Protection, Commissioner Vincent Sapienza, and Deputy Commissioners Angela Licata and Tassos Georgielis. Uh, from the Department of Sanitation, Commissioner Edward Grayson, and Deputy Commissioner Gregory Anderson. From the Department of Buildings, Commissioner Melanie LaRocca. And from the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development, Deputy Commissioner of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services, Anne Marie Santiago, and Associate Commissioner of Preservation, Kim Darga. From the Department of Transportation, Deputy Commissioner for Sidewalks and Inspection Management, Leon Hayward, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zack, and Executive Director of Capital Program Planning, Leslie Wolf. From FDNY, Deputy Assistant Chief Kevin Woods, and from NYPD, Chief of Operations Raymond Spinella and Director Michael Clark. Um, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yeah. I do. Thank you. You may begin your testimony when ready. Good morning, Chairs Rodriguez, Brannon, and Gennaro, and the members of the City Council. I'm John Scrivani, Commissioner of Emergency Management. I am pleased to be here today at my first council hearing since becoming Emergency Management Commissioner in late April. I am joined by my colleagues from DEP, DSNY, DOB, HPD, FDNY, NYPD, DOT, and the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency to outline the preparedness actions New York City took in the lead up to Hurricane Ida, the response during and after the storm, and the current services being provided as part of our ongoing recovery process. First, I want to acknowledge and give my condolences to those who lost loved ones as a result of this storm. This unprecedented storm has likely impacted people who, all, who we all know personally, and maybe even your own homes. Allow me, please, to acknowledge the pain of individuals who have lost their homes, irreplaceable items, and a sense of normalcy and security in what is already an extremely trying time due to the COVID-19 pandemic. New York City Emergency Management began tracking Hurricane Ida on August 26th, when it was then known as Tropical Depression 9. Based off multiple consultations with the National Weather Service, we activated the city's flash flood emergency plan on August 30th. The flash flood plan is, most is the most frequently activated plan. So far this year, it has, it has been activated 13 times, and in 2020, it was activated nine times. What does activating this plan mean? It sets off a cascading it sets off cascading instructions for various agencies and partners as they implement their portion of the plan to deal with the potential for excessive and rapid flooding. These components include all the agencies here with us today, as well as other partners such as the National Weather Service, the MTA, and the utility companies such as Con Edison and National Grid. For this storm, NISIM's actions included issuing a travel advisory on August 31st which included preparedness measures and warnings, hosting daily interagency conference calls with municipal and state agencies, utility partners, and public-private partners, placing the Downtree Task Force on alert, amplifying information to elected officials and community partners, issuing an advanced warning system message to, to disability service providers, and ultimately putting a travel ban in place. During the course of the event, NISM issued 30 Notify NYC messages informing people about service disruptions and aspects of the storm as it was happening. And the National Weather Service issued wireless emergency alerts, or WIAs, that were sent to all mobile phones in New York City. Our field responders were deployed in each borough so that they can assess dangerous conditions quickly. In addition to flooding conditions, they responded to eight other multi-agency incidents, including power outages at healthcare facilities, a retaining wall collapse, and fires. NYPD officers assisted New Yorkers in highly challenging situations. They conducted 166 total rescues, of which 69 were water rescues, and they also rescued more than 800 passengers from MTA trains. The NYPD worked with private tow companies to move more than 1,000 vehicles and went door to door in highly impacted neighborhoods. Members of the FDNY conducted hundreds of rescues 
and saved more than 500 New Yorkers trapped on flooded roadways and in submerged cars, subway stations, and buildings. In a number of these rescues, FDNY members used their extensive training to navigate deep waters and collapsed buildings. Their knowledge and experience of water rescue allowed them to remove individuals from dangerous situations and bring them to safety. It was, in general, an extremely rainy August. Between August 19th and September 1st, we saw over 16 inches of rain. However, this particular storm was unprecedented and a record we are sorry to see broken. Locally, we saw a maximum storm total of up to 10 inches of rain. At LaGuardia Airport, it was, it was the most recorded rain ever. In Central Park, it was the fifth highest on record. For emergency managers and for the city as a whole, we immediately pivoted our posture to consequence management. NISOM coordinates the, coordinated the opening of service centers, one in each borough, staffed by city agencies, non-private partners, the state, and FEMA, as a venue for affected residents to receive a wide range of resources and information, including, but not limited to, shelter needs, social service benefits available to them from all levels of government, food distribution, damage assessment guidance, dewatering information, distribution of Red Cross supplies, assistance to homes and businesses with various services, including cleaning and debris removal, and more. These service centers will remain open for as long as they are needed and have already seen over 2,200 households. For those who cannot come in or prefer a virtual option, all services are also available by calling 311 or going through the website www.nyc.gov slash IDA, which has already seen more than 60,000 visits to date. We want to thank the City Council and other elected officials, officials who have been instrumental in assisting us through this process by providing information, con connecting constituents, and assisting us with ensuring that the service center's locations are in known and comfortable locations. Multiple agency efforts related to recovery were also swiftly underway. The Department of Buildings responded to incidents, complaints, and referrals from agencies regarding storm damage. DOB is not issuing violations to property owners impacted by storm damage, and all DOB fees related to construction work associated with storm damage are waived, including permit fees. The Public Engagement Unit organized door-to-door -door knocking to ensure information in multiple languages was received directly by those affected, and NISOM and New York City Service activated Volunteer Coordination Task Force. In addition to staffing the service centers, the Department of Housing Preservation Development has been on the ground working to connect displaced residents with the American Red Cross for emergency hotel service, and its, and its ins inspectors have been responding to storm-related 311 complaints as well as assisting DOB with building inspections and assessments. The FDNY assisted with dewatering operations and clearing down trees. My colleagues at DEP and DSNY will testify after me in greater detail of their roles and responsibilities and operations. The administration's role does not end when the response is over and recovery is underway. NISOM will conduct an after action assessment both internally and with our agency partners to best assess what we can do better in the future. Constant improvement is part of our core mission to best serve New Yorkers during, before, before, during, and after emergencies. We do and will continue to ensure that climate change and its consequences are incorporated into all of our plans and actions. Hurricane season is not over, and the potential for, for severe rain and flooding is a year-round concern. We encourage all individuals and families to make an emergency plan that works for you. Have a go bag filled with items that you may need in an emergency. Identify an emergency contact both within and outside of the city, and please sign up for Notify NYC, the city's free emergency communications program that provides alerts in multiple languages by visiting our website, calling 311, or by downloading our app in multiple languages by visiting our website. Oh, I said that already, my apologies. I now turn to my colleagues for their testimony. And after this panel is, after this panel is available to take your questions. Thank you very much for your time and attention. 
I now turn it over to Department of Environmental Protection Commissioner Sapienza. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Scrivani. Good morning, chairs and, and council members. I am Vincent Sapienza, the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. On behalf of the agency, I want to express our condolences to the family and friends of people who lost their lives during the storm. For those who experienced damage and losses to their homes and businesses, we know that recovery is not easy, and we at DEP commit our continuing support. DEP is responsible for the city's drinking water supply and for the wastewater collection and treatment systems, which include 7,500 miles of sewer pipes that convey sanitary, sewage, and storm water. Much of that infrastructure was designed and constructed decades ago for what is clearly a different climate reality. During the past several years, significant capital improvements have been made using a variety of tools, which I'll speak about shortly, but obviously far greater investments are required. I want to point out that the total amount of rainfall during a storm um, is not what presents the challenge, but rather rainfall rates or intensity. Uh, occasionally during intense summer storms in New York City, rainfall rates can exceed the capacity of local sewers, resulting in water accumulating on streets and highways. This periodically triggers the National Weather Service to issue flash flood watches and warnings. The city has a long-standing flash flood emergency plan that is routinely activated uh, when storms of such intensity are forecast. Given the forecast that we had for Ida, city agencies jointly activated the plan's protocols on August 30th. The record smashing 3.15 inches of rain that fell within an hour just after sunset was not forecast. The deluge far exceeded the capacity of the city sewer system, causing significant quantities of water to quickly accumulate on the ground. But water does not accumulate uniformly, rather it runs downhill rapidly to the lowest geographic point. Major flooding began to occur in those low-lying areas. At around 9.30 p.m., the National Weather Service issued the first ever flash flood emergency for New York City. By that time, city agencies were already responding to life-threatening flooding. Community driveways, which are below-grade alleys behind residential streets that provide access to basement-level garages, were significantly flooded. Many of these garages have over the years been converted into living spaces. While these community driveways are private property, the city is committing to finding drainage solutions to prevent future threats to public safety. I want to dispel the notion that clogged catch basins were responsible for the flooding. DEP programmatically inspects and cleans 148,000 catch basins to ensure that local streets and highways are drained. We also work in partnership with DSNY and DOT to support removal of litter which is the primary cause of clogged catch basins. Again, the flooding from Ida was a sewer system capacity issue, not a catch basin issue. As extreme weather events become more frequent due to climate change, we need to continue making improvements to the city's drainage infrastructure. DEP's four-year capital plan includes $2.3 billion within 278 projects to improve drainage. One major effort is the Southeast Queens uh, program where Mayor de Blasio committed $2 billion to build storm sewers. High-level storm sewers are another tool that will be leveraged. Unlike traditional deep sewers that are very costly to upgrade, supplementary, non-networked, high-level storm sewers can, in some neighborhoods, be added just below the street surface to convey storm water directly to a nearby waterway. In partnership with the mayor's office and other city agencies, DEP performed a cloudburst planning study in 2017 that identified Primary sites for cloudburst design strategies, which integrate stormwater retention into open spaces and streetscapes, informed by Copenhagen's internationally recognized approach. We have two cloudburst projects in Queens that are in the design phase, one at NYCHA uh, at the South Jamaica Houses, and the other in the public right-of-way in St. Albans. We've received funding from FEMA for a feasibility study for a project in East Harlem, and we are exploring ways to expand this important program across the city. Keeping stormwater out of the sewer system is a major objective for our drainage program. And so New York City has implemented the most aggressive green infrastructure program in the country. Over the past several years, we've built more than 11,000 curbside rain gardens and infiltration basins and implemented many best, best management practices for green infrastructure. We also partner with NYCHA, the Departments of Education and Parks and Recreation and other agencies to retrofit paved areas with green infrastructure. 
We have built more than 70 blue belts across Staten Island have, and have begun to expand the program into Queens and the Bronx. In total, there are more than 14,000 acres of blue belts in the city. We've also partnered with DOT on a pilot program to install porous pavement along the curb lines of city streets. In addition to our capital projects, we are developing the unified storm water rule, which will streamline existing stormwater management requirements for new and redeveloped properties that connect to the city's sewer system. The unified rule will result in new developments managing more stormwater on their sites. I want to thank the new leadership at the MTA for recently partnering with us on storm preparation, and I look forward to working jointly to implement additional protective measures. Obviously, none of these upgrades are cheap. Improvements to drainage are currently funded through water bills that New York City residents pay. Keeping water rates affordable while funding major capital work can't happen without a significant infusion of federal funding. Finally, I want to acknowledge the work of DEP staff uh, over, during the storm, both before, during, and after. Uh, they've continued to work diligently, and we've been aiding communities that have been affected by the flooding, uh, including offering free pumping services to anyone that needs it. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it off to my colleague, uh, Commissioner Ed Grayson at Department of Sanitation. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Brannan, Chair Gennaro, Chair Rodriguez, and the members of the City Council Committees on Resiliency and Waterfronts, Transportation, and Environmental Protection. I am Edward Grayson, Commissioner of New York City's Department of Sanitation. We thank you for the opportunity to testify on the Department's preparation for and response to the devastating flooding caused by the remnants of Hurricane Ida. First, I want to recognize the tremendous and devastating impact of this storm on so many New Yorkers. Their homes and their most treasured possessions, their livelihoods are gone. And in some cases, very sadly, our fellow New Yorkers have lost their lives. In advance of extreme rainfall and other tropical weather events, the Department of Sanitation works closely with our fellow agencies to implement planning and preparedness activities. As Commissioner Scrivani described, DSNY plays an important role in the city's flash flood emergency plan. On Tuesday, August 31st, DSNY, DEP, and DOT inspected and cleaned 1,000 catch basins in major flooding hotspots, as well as all catch basins on major highways. DSNY also regularly conducts tests and preparedness at our facilities, ensuring that we have continuity of operations to help the city recover after major weather events. As soon as the rain began to slow overnight on September 1st, by the, depart the department pivoted into an emergency response posture. By Thursday morning, department supervisors were out in the field surveying affected neighborhoods and developing deployment strategies for emergency response operations. That day, we deployed the first crews to begin cleaning up debris, and we have not stopped since. We've worked with local community leaders to bring dumpsters to the hardest hit communities, and we immediately informed both residents and employees to expect the department to work throughout the Labor Day holiday. And while many employees themselves were affected by flooding at home, the department continued to provide regular refuse and recycling collection, more than 12,000 tons per day, with only minor delays. Early in the morning on September 2nd, we worked with the Department of Transportation to suspend alternate side parking regulations. And that suspension was later extended through the Rosh Hashanah holiday on September 8th. The department also suspended all enforcement activities for dirty sidewalks, trash shutouts, and other sanitation violations and that enforcement suspension continues in the affected areas. Since that Thursday, DSNY has provided round-the-clock debris removal operations in neighborhoods affected by the storm. To date, sanitation workers have worked more than 60,000 hours on debris removal and storm cleanup activities, removing more than 15,000 tons of debris, including more than 7,500 tons in the borough of Queens. Our crews have repeatedly visit, visited every affected block coming back day after day as residents continue the slow, painful, and tearful work of removing debris, possessions, furniture, and treasured keepsakes from their homes. In addition to our work, the City Cleanup Corps also contributed to the recovery work. Immediately following the storm, thousands of Corps members were out clearing accumulated litter and storm debris across the city. Since last week, 140 Corps members have helped seniors and other New Yorkers in need to remove storm debris, furniture, and appliances from their homes. To date, Corps members have loaded an estimated 48,600 bags of litter and debris citywide. 
I've spent the last two weeks in neighborhoods across the city, speaking to residents, supervising operations, and working on the ground with many of my fellow commissioners who joined me at this hearing today. We know the work is not yet done. Many homeowners and residents continue to sift through the damaged belongings and pull sheetrock off the walls. I want them to know that we are there for them. We will keep coming until all the work is done. I want to thank all the sanitation workers, uniformed officers, and support staff for their dedicated commitment over these last two weeks, as well as all other city workers who've been involved. They have proven yet again that they are heroes, truly essential workers that will move literal mountains to help their fellow New Yorkers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Good morning. I am Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency. I would like to thank Chairs Brannon, Gennaro, and Rodriguez for the opportunity to testify today. I would also like to acknowledge my colleagues from New York City Emergency Management, Department of Environment, the Departments of Environmental Protection and Sanitation, as well as the Departments of Housing, Preservation and Development, Buildings and Transportation, NYPD, and FDNY this morning who will join me in responding to your questions. I'd also like to express my condolences to those who lost loved ones during the storm. As you know, the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency is responsible for ensuring that New York City is prepared to withstand and emerge stronger from the impacts of climate change. Our role is to lead the city's strategic direction and planning to prepare for extreme events and chronic impacts and coordinate with agencies to implement this work. Within our $20 billion resiliency portfolio, the city is preparing to adapt to a variety of climate hazards. We call this a multi-hazard approach since it addresses all the climate threats that impact our city including a significant focus on managing extreme rainfall and stormwater. This work has been in progress for more than a decade and includes hundreds of completed projects as well as important policy changes such as reforms to building and zoning codes. While we are urgently working to address multiple risks, including coastal storm surge, extreme heat waves, and chronic tidal flooding, my testimony today will focus on how we're protecting New Yorkers from intense rainfalls from storms like hurricanes Henri and Ida. Our climate adaptation strategy also takes a multi-layered approach. This means that we are focused on establishing multiple lines of defense at different scales across the city to respond to the multiple hazards. As we have seen most recently with Hurricane Ida and recent historic storms, all these lines of defense, such as green infrastructure, expanded sewers, grid resiliency, emergency communication, and flood insurance are critical components of our system. And our work to develop and strengthen our infrastructure in response to these climate hazards must move forward with urgency, funding, and partnership within all levels of government. We are optimistic, for example, that the American Jobs Plan will provide the city funding to tackle these large infrastructure projects. Congress is considering both a bipartisan infrastructure bill and budget reconciliation bill. The city has worked to ensure that green infrastructure, climate investments, and strong investments in housing are included in these packages. Congress is currently drafting the budget reconciliation bill and we expect more action and hopefully final passage in the next few weeks. Concurrently following the storm, the city worked with the federal dele delegation to identify federal disaster funding programs to assist with recovery. The House delegation sent a letter to the chair of the Appropriations Committee asking for a supplemental disaster funding package, one that includes transit dollars, CDBGDR, and funding for homeowner retrofits, among others. President Biden also requested disaster spending to help, the needs of, uh, help meet the needs of communities affected by Ida. We also will need to work with the state to shore up subway infra infrastructure. As we all witness, the MTA cannot handle these types of events and need to address their critical infrastructure. The need to address their critical infrastructure is paramount. It's why the mayor has called for speeding up full implementation of congestion pricing, which will inject billions of dollars into the system. The city has taken extensive steps to address the risk caused by extreme rainfall. The Department of Environmental Pro Protection is lead the lead agency for this work. Specifically, they are responsible for maintaining and expanding the sewer and water capture system. Each year, the department invests hundreds of millions of dollars to upgrade the entire city's drainage system, which serves both inland and coastal areas. They are also investing heavily in nature-based solutions. For example, over the last two plus decades, DEP constructed more than 70 blue belts across Staten Island. New York City also has the most aggressive green infrastructure program in the country. Additionally, in the past several years, the department has built more than 11,000 curbside rain gardens, infiltration basins, and implemented best practices in green infrastructure, as Commissioner Sapienza mentioned. 
innovative stormwater capture projects using what we refer to as cloudburst design, specifically designed to address heavy downpours, are also ongoing at NYCHA housing developments and being, and being designed for street medians. These cloudburst stormwater management strategies are a mix of gray and green infrastructure designed for large volume events to absorb water where possible and store excess water safely until the event passes. These projects can also provide amenities and increase open space. We look forward to working with DEP to expand, expand cloudburst design beyond the pilot areas. Areas that face unique, unique risks are getting special investments. For example, we know that many areas in Southeast Queens are particularly vulnerable to rainfall-based flooding. To address this vulnerability, DEP, along with DOT and DDC, are currently engaged in a massive $1.9 billion build-out of the sewer system there to alleviate flooding and improve the quality of life for residents and businesses. This work and future investments will be strengthened and guided, guided by our stormwater resiliency plan, which was required by council legislation and released earlier this year. The stormwater plan outlines exactly where the city expects to see future stormwater flooding and lays out key actions that the city is taking now and in the future to strengthen our resiliency. Hurricane Ida made it clear that we must speed up and augment these efforts. And Mayor de Blasio has created an extreme weather task force to do exactly that. The city is also leading the way with best practices in stormwater management under the climate resiliency design guidelines. We're grateful for Council's partnership in incorporating these guidelines into Local Law 41 of 2021, which will ensure that new public facilities and infrastructure projects are designed to withstand the more severe flooding we expect in the future. DEP will also evaluate their long-term drainage planning with future conditions in mind. However, even with these significant investments and policy changes, we must recognize that we can never fully eliminate risk. Encouraging New Yorkers to protect their financial health with flood insurance is another important component of our strategy. We are continuing to advocate in Washington for reforms to the National Flood Insurance Program that would increase affordability for low-income households. This program will come up for reauthorization at the end of this month, so there's a critical window for action. Additionally, earlier this summer, we launched a $1 million advertising campaign in partnership with FEMA to explain the importance of flood insurance and promote risk awareness. We're also exploring opportunities to retrofit New York City's existing buildings. Our office was recently awarded FEMA funding to conduct a study of where and when backwater valves work best in the city. Our goal is to understand how this tool can benefit New Yorkers and how to develop a sustainable program that will reduce flooding in homes and businesses. While the city is, of course, limited in our ability to fund a large-scale retrofit program, we are always exploring ways to partner with different levels of government to strengthen our existing building stock. We look forward to working with council as the study progresses. There is no doubt that much more work remains to be done to adapt New York City to a hotter and wetter future. Even with more funding, reforms, and partnership, implementing new and complex solutions won't be easy and will require incredible thoughtfulness and participation of many communities and stakeholders over the coming years and decades. We also recognize the need for comprehensive solutions that account for the city's multiple and often simultaneous hazards. Despite the significant scope of the work ahead, I remain optimistic about our ability to meet these challenges rapidly and equitably for all New Yorkers. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts, the Committee on Environmental Protection, and the Committee on Transportation for allowing me to testify here today. I look forward to answering your questions about the strategic planning and response to the threats faced by climate change. Thank you. Uh, I would like to let the public know that the NYPD are also here and that they will be ready, even though they are not preparing, presenting testimony, but they're ready to answer questions uh, on how, from the NYPD perspective, they also respond during this storm. So they are here present, ready to answer questions. Second, I would like to let everyone know that after we finish with the uh, panels uh, from the administration at 12, we will have the MTA as a second panel responding question related to uh, the public transit system. So as we will ask any question, you be aware that any question related to the MTA will be asked in the second panel. But before we get into a question, I'd like to ask uh, everyone to please stand up for a moment of silence in the name of those people that we lost as a result of this storm.
there's no doubt that, you know, we are the best city in the whole nation, in the whole world. And we all have to be thankful to the men and women that you guys and the rest of your team that are the one that had to be accountable for planning and execute the plan. Our role from this side to oversight, but you are the one that had to be working 24 seven to be sure that you identify the best leaders in each agency ready to respond in any type of disaster. And, and, and I can say that we as a council appreciate in the whole city, and I know that you did the best you could. So any question that we will ask about uh, how, what did we learn, uh, what went wrong, how can we be better prepared, is not uh, disqualifying the great job that the, you as the leaders and, and others in each agency here and, and the rest did, had done not only during this past storm, but in any disaster that New York City has been uh, dealing with. And we know that the city, we always have to be planned to be better, to be stronger, and that's what we expected to come out from this hearing. Uh, I feel that I have a few questions. I know that my colleagues also have a question, so I don't pretend to cover every single area, but at least a few of those questions that my colleague will uh, continue asking questions. My own experience is that we have a all infrastructure. And this is something that I know that all of us agree. There's a lot of things that we have on the ground that sometimes engineering agency, we find at the time that we are doing certain projects. And I feel that that all infrastructure that we have play a role when it comes to the accumulation of waters that we get in our street. And I can give you, let's say, a local sample. In my own district, Riverside Drive and Seaman Avenue is one of those intersections that I can tell you since elected in 2009, I have been bringing that intersection to the previous administration and to the current administration. 12 years highlighting that that particular area is the area that if you get even less than one inch of water, all those business indictment will be dealing with the flooding because the water is coming from the Fort Tryon Park. And all this leaf that go down there accumulating. By the same thing that you will find out at Nago Avenue indictment because in that side, the east part of the northern Manhattan, then we have the Highbridge Park. And all the water come down from the bridge, from the Highbridge Park, and it's an hour or two of raining, and water is accumulating. 12 years highlighting to all the administration that something must be done. Agency, they don't connect. Agency, what I gave, we will look at it but there's no action. And I feel that that would not happen if that would be close to Central Park. That would not happen if it's a close to Central, uh, Park, Central Park West, Fifth Avenue, and it's the same experience that we will hear through borough, borough after borough when it comes to challenges that we have or the need to invest in millions of dollars in capital to deal with those local situations. So, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna be asking a question because what can you tell me? That you will look at your team, but I can tell you from Major Bloomberg to Major de Blasio, it's not lack of being noticed, is that those areas has not been priority. And, and, and I feel again that we have that responsibility to deal with certain area. The Dykeman Public Housing is one of those areas that when you look at Sandy, they got water into those buildings. Talk about Academy Street, 10th Avenue. That has not been included in any investment. It didn't suffer during this storm, but that's the potential area to come. 
And we know, again, we are no, still we're rookie in government, but it's already two years. We also know that we have limited resources, but sometimes we also have to deal with the fact that when it comes to investing, making the decision to invest in upgraded infrastructure, underserved, poor neighborhood have been left out. That's in general what I wanted to bring. But I, uh, now looking at what happened, especially in those cases of people that many of them, they die in their basement, I have a question. The first question is, at what time do, does the city has a system to communicate with the homeowners? And if that's the case, at what time did the homeowners would receive a notice that their basement could be in risk as a result of the flooding? All right, thank you, sir. I appreciate your question. And, and first, I'd like to just thank you for your opening comments about our teams. Uh, the, as you mentioned, these folks are really working hard. They, uh, they're not going home. And uh, I think your words really resonate with them, and we really appreciate you making those as opening comments. So, so thank you. Thank you for that. So thank you very much. All right, so to address your specific question, multiple warnings were going out regarding the storm, pre-storm and during the storm, both from uh, New York City and the um, National Weather Service, as you probably had received on your phone. Your specific question about did we um, direct people to evacuate their basements, that is not in the current messaging, and that's what the mayor has addressed in the Extreme Weather Task Force, where we are going to be doing that, and we'll be releasing that information next week. We have uh, developed messaging to give people guidance on when we believe that the weather will change rapidly and we may see a situation. We have been asked by the mayor to make sure we are leaning forward and looking at worst case scenario, not just the forecast that's been provided to us. Um, so we will be leaning forward. I can give you in the council an outline of all the messages that have gone, had gone out that pre-storm and during the storm. Um, it's a uh, quite extensive list. You know, we had sent out um, probably almost 30 messages pre and during the storm. Um, but to your specific question of did we put out one that said specifically evacuate your basement? No, we did not. So hopefully, you know, we, as you say, the task force and you guys work on it, but you know, it is so unfortunately that we didn't have the system in place, but that was the area to move forward. It, why was the city, in which area do you feel that the city could be better prepared to deal with this flooding? So I think you, you just addressed that. We, um, we need to add a couple of new tools to the toolbox. One of them is being more aggressive on our messaging and not just taking the forecasts that we receive at face value and tre really trying to look at them as what is the possible worst case scenario so that we can get messages out quickly. So from the messaging perspective, we, we have a comprehensive plan. The mayor will be releasing that in the coming weeks. We're ready to uh, launch that. So on the, uh, from the emergency management side, there's the messaging. Obviously, we need your partnership um, we need to make sure people are prepared to move if something does happen. Uh, as, as Janie mentioned, we have multiple hazards that come at us simultaneously. We're dealing with a pandemic, we're dealing with uh, climate change and extreme weather, and we really need uh, the council and all the other elected officials' help to partner with us to make sure we get that preparedness message out, as I mentioned in my testimony. Um, prepared people fare better when we have emergencies. They get the information quicker because they, they know what to look for. So preparedness is key, messaging is key, and you know, to, to speak to broader uh, you know, preparedness on what we can possibly do with infrastructure, I'll ask the, uh, Commissioner Sapienza to address that. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I, I want to, um, you know, Chair Rodriguez, re, re, just respond to your question about old infrastructure. And, Agreed. A lot of our uh, sewer infrastructure is old, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't function 
as it was originally built to do, which it does. It was just designed and built for a different time, uh, a different reality, both climate and city. Um, and so we, we, we know uh, that it needs to be improved. We, as I mentioned in my testimony, we spend about $500 million a year in, in upgrading our drainage infrastructure in the city. Um, in, in Southeast Queens, a long underserved community, the mayor has uh, committed $2 billion, much of which uh, has already been spent over the last five years to, to provide a modern drainage system there. So, so those things are underway, but um, you know, we, we, if we want to meet the challenges of climate change, obviously a lot more has to be spent. Okay. And I might chime in here as well. Um, you know, I think um, Commissioner Sapienza also uh, mentioned this in his testimony, as did I, that sewer infrastructure, um, even if we work to modernize it to incorporate uh, climate change projections, is, is only going to be part of the solution. We can only build sewers so big, they're going to have their limitations. And so we need to continue to pair those investments with investments in more innovative stormwater management practices uh, like green infrastructure, which um, DEP has already been leading on. Um, and we also need to, to continue to expand our cloudburst management program. Um, as both Commissioner Sapiens and I mentioned in our testimonies, um, you know, we've been piloting those cloudburst management projects um, uh, on, on, in a, on a project level basis. Um, we've been learning from Copenhagen, which is really the city that's leading on this uh, kind of uh, uh, management practices. We've learned from Copenhagen that cloudburst projects decrease volume um, of water entering the sewer system by 30 percent, um, which is really an incredible number. So we have an opportunity to expand those kinds of practices and basically it's taking open spaces, green spaces, and streetscapes and turning them into stormwater retention areas. They would, during blue skies, um, remain, you know, the, the open spaces, green spaces, and streets um, and provide recreational amenities and other benefits um, to, to the community. I also want, want to mention, Chair, since you brought up the point about equity, that this is incredibly important to us. Um, we absolutely want to make sure that we're approaching this work with equity in mind. The stormwater management, uh, the stormwater resiliency plan and the maps that were provided with those plans show us where the risk is uh, from rainfall itself. But we also need to overlay equity concerns on top of that in order to decide where to make investments in these cloudburst management practices and other, other stormwater uh, investments. I also just wanted to address, you mentioned public housing. We have invested over $3 billion in public housing upgrades since Sandy, specifically focused on resiliency. Look, I just feel that it's better to take the approach to recognize where we have failed. Is a more positive conversation because if we take the approach to justify and come out with the numbers, make things beautiful, I can tell you last year, I was with Carlo Menchaca in his district and uh, uh, visited some of those uh, public housing. And those were projects that still, as a result, on night on Sunday, still NYCHA has not fixed it. And, and I think that if we get back and forward, here we have a couple million dollars, as I say. DP, you go to Riverside Drive in Dagman and Seaman, or go back to the record on the time of Bloomberg, Mayor de Blasio, first and second term. No one has been put in the resources to deal with the, why the train is not working, why, and I can tell you, without being an engineer, for me it's about all the water come from the Fort Tryon Park. When the summer is over, all those leaves, they go underground, and it's like an hour or two of raining, and that whole area is like a little lake. You go to the other area to the east side, Diamond, down the river side, the, the hybrid park is the same thing. So I feel it's, you know, like, it's better to understand that each of us will bring different, you know, experience in the district that we represent. As I said from the beginning, I'm one of those council members that I'm happy to say, working together with this administration, we have made important accomplishments. But the level of frustration and how certain part of the city has been left out is real, and we have to take responsibility. And that's when we talk about the local part. Because when we talk about the citywide view, our responsibility is to protect every single 1.6 million New Yorkers, 
regardless of the social, economic, ethnic background, or the sea cold where they live. So, but this experience, you know, we live Sunday, we live the other natural disaster. And to deal with things, taking this situation by surprise, it's difficult to swallow. And I feel that, again, like, I, I'm happy to, you know, as USP bring up those numbers of the investment of City Hall, but also understand that there's a lot more and we have to recognize that in certain area, we could do better. Preparing before, during, and then after the start. And my second question before uh, turning to my colleague is related to a, when it comes to sanitation, who are, and again, I will understand that DEP has a lot of responsibility to be sure that the system is working. But if you go to a particular area, I can bring one of us, Diamond and Broadway, and you look under the drain, you see a lot of garbage. You see that that area are not clean. So when the water comes, in many of those locations, they are close to entry train station. What type of assessment has been done? How often are we looking at the drain system to be sure that they are working, that they are clean, so that we are prepared? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for that question. So there's about 148,000 catch basins uh, around the city, and DEP uh, programmatically inspects and, and cleans them um, all year round. But you're right, that street litter is, is the primary problem that we see. Um, in, in some commercial districts, uh, we're, we're out cleaning catch basins much more frequently than, than in, in residential areas. Uh, but we do work with Department of Sanitation, the street sweeping program uh, with New York City DOT for cleaning highways, and that's part of uh, our regular programs and also part of the, um, the, the fast footing uh, emergency plan that we, we carry out a day or two before known storms are coming. Turn it over to Ed. Yes, Chair. So uh, the routine maintenance and cleanliness above grade, so above the grates, that, is, that comes into our purview because we sweep the streets and try to keep them clean. Everything below grade naturally gets cleared out by the professionals at DEP because they have to go in and get inside the grate. And uh, most of the city that uh, is included in the alternate side parking program gets mechanical broom service at least once a week. And we have additional uh, MLP staff as well as district officers that will take appropriate action when they see a litter condition. However, um, litter does build up every day, as we all know, so it's more of a, a balance. In this particular event, and is when, whenever we uh, enact the flash flood plan, um, the Department of Sanitation goes out to a specific number of uh, catch basins that are in known problematic areas to make sure to inspect, clean everything that's above grade if there's any deficiencies there, and notify DEP uh, if they have to go below grade prior to the start of the storm. DP in collaboration on sanitation, how the men and women power, or how many, how many, what is the men and power that you have dedicated yet to do regularly going out and maintain those sites clean and ready for water when the water's coming? And can we think about a system where is a resident take a photo and send information that the agency can say we can, you know, go and clean that particular site in these numbers of days, these numbers of weeks? Yeah, Mr. Chair, so we do about 50,000 catch basin cleanings per year. Um, most of them are just programmatic, but we do take 311 calls. Uh, if a homeowner says, you know, I have some, some ponding uh, on my block because I think a catch basin is, is blocked up, we'll go out and do those. Um, but, but again, most of, most of the work we just do based upon inspections and, and, and programmatic cleaning. Um, I, 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 again, you know, as Commissioner Grayson mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of it is, is street debris, so the message to get out to everyone is, uh, you know, try to avoid littering because that's primarily what's causing catch basins to get blocked up. But you don't think that the city can have the men and women power that when they identify anyone who take a photo and can notify the agency 
that in, they can commit it to say in a week or seven days or two weeks, we can send it in and clean that site. Yeah, and we generally do. So if someone uh, either contacts us or more, more likely through 311, we're generally out there within, okay. within a week to do that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my last question to the NYPD. You were the one that had the men and women out that night, uh, taking care of that, giving direction to people, uh, uh, especially around the train stations. What were the experience that uh, you guys as an entity deal with uh, when it comes to safety and, and directing people uh, especially those who were trapped in the train station in the surrounding area to be safe. There were six trains that were stopped in the tunnel. We evacuated approximately 135 people. And basically we used our emergency service team who are more, more trained in uh, evacuation procedures than regular patrol people. Chief, what can be learned? What, what do you think based on that experience we can say there's a one, two, or three thing that we can do better to well, deal with this type of situation. So what we learned is um, in, in order to um, be prepared, what we're going to do in the future, we know which, sta which stations you know, flood um, when they have an excess of rain. So we're going to pre-stage people in those locations. So we will either, we'll either close those stations or um, um, We'll have cops pre-staged at those uh, particular locations where we experience historical flooding. Okay, thank you. So I have a question by my colleagues who was waiting. I'm going to give the turn to them, saying so I will get back. Chairman, Justin Brown. Thank you, Chair. I just want to read into the record quickly. Um, my, one of my colleagues, uh, Councilwoman Sylvana Brooks Powers, who couldn't join us today, but she represents uh, Far Rockaway, Arbor, and Edgemere. So I just I wanted to read this into the record quickly, uh, her statement. Hurricane Ida is just the latest reminder. Climate change is our new reality, and it's already impacting our communities. Storms that used to be once-in-a-lifetime events are now occurring much more frequently. The response from all levels of government needs to meet the urgency of the moment, and we must commit to solving this crisis. The City Council has made historic progress in combating climate change by setting ambitious climate targets to reduce the city's carbon emissions. For instance, the Climate Mobilization Act of 2019 introduced higher standards for new large building constructions, upgrades for utility efficiency, and green roof renovations. Other key pieces of legislation, like the Fiber Resiliency Plan, hopefully will get done soon. We can all see the evidence that our current work is not sufficient. Videos circulate social media of flooding in our streets and subway stations, forest fires ravaging across the West Coast and destroying homes. It's time we act and do more. We cannot afford to continue responding reactively to the effects of climate change. We must be proactive. We must redouble our efforts. This means investing in NYCHA, our public transportation infrastructure, and so much more as we as New Yorkers rely on each day. Otherwise, future disasters will continue Wrecking, uh, wreaking de deadly havoc on our communities. Our city agencies must be equipped and prepared for these disasters. We know what agents, we need to know what agencies like the MTA are doing to safeguard our critical infrastructure against the threats of a warmer world. That's from uh, Councilwoman Sylvana Brooks Powers. Uh, thank you for, for allowing me to read that into the record. Um, I guess uh, for OEM, how is the information that, that, this, that, that we receive um, from the National Weather Service, how is that then synthesized uh, into, you know, what the preparation will be? I think as, as a layman, um, it certainly felt like we were, with, with Tropical Storm uh, Henri, it felt like we were really bracing for it and prepared for it, and then I felt like um, uh, Ida was the opposite. Like we knew it was coming, but we weren't, we, it, we weren't making as big a deal as we were making about Henri. And, and, it, and I'd like to know that, and I'd like to know how that the information that when National Weather Service puts out, you know, information that, that you and I, or me, I might just see as a tweet or something, on a higher level with OEM, how is that information uh, synthesized and what is done with that information? Yes, yeah, sir, thank you for that question. So although they're both considered tropical systems, the approach of Henri coming from offshore makes it a much more um, difficult challenge because we're looking at the coastal storm impacts like a sandy type event and we're looking at evacuations. Our communication is coming from both the local weather service office and the National Hurricane Center in a situation like that. 
IDER is completely different because it made landfall in Louisiana. It then just gets handed off to the local weather service office. We are no longer communicating with the hurricane center because it is not a tropical system by definition that's coming from uh, the ocean at that point. It's coming over land. So we are getting communication. As we you know, mentioned in the testimony, we started watching this storm well in advance. Um, we were forecasted to get up to six inches of rain, but as was mentioned earlier, six inches of rain over five, six, seven hours is not what we received. The original forecast was for, <clears throat> excuse me, a very heavy rain event over multiple hours. That time ended up getting compressed to, as, as Commissioner Sapienza said, the intensity that the system, the storm sewer system just could not handle. So our communication, uh, depending on the approach of the storm, the type of the storm is a little bit different because the National Weather Service does has, have different tools and different, you know, um, I guess entities within their own program that we'll communicate with. But because of the, the difference of one coming from the ocean and one coming over land, it, the way we receive our information is, is not exactly the same. I, I hope that answers your question. Sh sure, thank you. So are, th are there now, what have we learned, I guess, from, from the, the, the signs that um, Ida was giving us that maybe obviously a storm that devastates New Orleans and then travels a thousand miles across land a couple days later to, to wreak havoc on, on, you know, Hollis, Queens is, is unprecedented. But are there things now that we saw from Ida that are going to be uh, harbingers for the future of knowing, okay, well, we, you know, are we going to sort of um, go to the mattresses, so to speak, for every storm? I mean, how are we, how are we going to sort of have those, those, that triage? It's very challenging. Um, I'm not a meteorologist or a climate scientist. I'm, you know, reliant on what the forecasters give us. Um, but I have to look at it through a different lens to your point of are we going to go to the mattresses and go, you know, overboard. As I mentioned in my earlier statement, uh, we're looking at worst case scenario much differently. They're giving us uh, information if they tell us there's six inches of rain, um, we'll work with the team to assume that's going to come down in one hour possibly. And what would we need to do, you know, prior to that to make sure that residents are alerted Obviously, the basement apartments is a, is a super focus now, so we got to figure out how to get that message out. We need your help to do that. You know your communities, uh, and you know we send messages out in multiple languages, up to 14 languages, but we want to make sure we're getting the right message to everybody. So on the, you know, what have we learned? I mean, I think we've learned that we just have to be hyper aggressive with letting people know what we're seeing, um, you know, we can't be reliant on people's apps on their phones or watching the news for the weather. We're going to, you know, the mayor has asked us to over communicate and that's what we're planning on doing. We're over communicating and being as aggressive as we can to uh, get out there and execute the plans and clean the streets and as well as note message people as much as we can and really give as much advance warning of what people should do. And that was the preparedness message I was speaking to earlier. For the, um, thank you, for the, the, uh, the mayor recently announced the formation of the 30-day extreme weather task force. So I, two questions, has the task force convened yet? And then after 30 days, will there be a report on, on the findings or, or how, and then how will those recommendations be acted upon? So the answer to both your questions is yes. We have met multiple times already. We met the day after he announced it um, and we have met almost every day since. Um, there will be a report that's generated that I'm sure the mayor will be communicating himself. Okay. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Sepienza, um, I want to talk about the very exciting and, and sexy issue of the New York City sewer system. Um, as I've learned now, uh, the city sewer system is designed to handle about one and a half to two inches of rain per hour. Is that right? That's correct, Mr. Okay. Chair. So, now that we're seeing, we're seeing storms now that are bringing us more than three inches of rain an hour, um, which I think we can all agree is extraordinary, um, but no longer unprecedented. Um, what is the plan going forward as far as, is the city planning to redesign the sewer systems to increase capacity? That's first question. And second is any uh, current replacement projects that are underway um, 
when a new sewer is installed at this point, I'm hoping that we're not installing those same sewers that we're saying are being, you know, inundated. So are, are, is the new model sewer uh, capable of handling more water? Uh, and and are, are there projects underway right now that are installing those new sewer systems? So it, it's a complicated question, but I'll try to boil it down as much as I can. So right now, the system is designed to handle about half of what we saw in Ida, uh, you know, from, from one and three quarter inches to three and a half inches um, in an hour. So to say we're going to, you know, rip out the entire 7,500 miles of sewers and put in sewers twice as big is not going to happen. We, we, we know that. It's, it's physically infeasible. It would cost $100 billion, so we're not going there. So what we're looking at is ways to supplement the system. You, you, you heard from Janie about the green infrastructure program, keeping stormwater runoff out of the sewer system in the first place, using the, the ground to absorb it or retain it or store it. So we're, we're moving forward with that. The other thing is supplemental non-networked sewers, something called high-level storm sewers. These, they're called high-level because they're just below the street surface, not deep like old traditional sewers, you know, some which may be 70 feet down, um, to just peel off some of the storm water and localize the areas and carry it away to a, a local water body like a river or a stream. So there's a bunch of things that we are doing, but um, you know, we just can't say those 7,500 miles of sewers, let's have a plan to double size it's not feasible. No, yeah, I, I, under, I, under, I mean, look, a lot of the infrastructure that we take for granted under our feet that's 100 years old, we can't send the whole city to Aruba while we replace everything, I get that. Um, but, but I'd like to drill down on if there are, is there a, a blueprint for a city sewer, right? If, if I'm getting a new sewer put in in my neighborhood, that sewer that's being installed, is it, have more capacity than the sewers that got overwhelmed during these storms? Or are we installing the same sewers? Yeah. So it, it, the answer is it, it may be larger. So let me, let me explain it this way. So the sewer system in New York City is like a tree. On local streets, the sewers are like the branches of a tree. Those feed into larger sewers, like the limbs of a tree down avenues or boulevards, which then feed into even larger sewers, like the trunk of a tree. If you want to say, well, I'm having um, you know, flooding issues on my local blocks, I want a larger branch sewer, it really affects the whole system. So it's just that we can't just upgrade those branches without everything else. It makes it complicated. So that's why, again, we're looking at supplementary ways of improving drainage, green infrastructure, high-level storm sewers, retention. Those are, the, those are more of the better tools for now. All right, so I, w I was speaking with a friend earlier about um, but normally in the south shore of Staten Island, where normally during just a simple rainstorm, they would get flooded. But now that there have been new sewers installed in his neck of the woods, during Ida, he didn't see any, any flooding. So the, the sewers that were installed, say, somewhere like in the south shore, are those sewers being installed elsewhere? And, what are, and what, what's different about those sewers? So. Most of the city is, has what's called a combined sewer system. It's the older type system. It's one pipe beneath each city street that handles both sanitary sewage and storm runoff. Um, newer, newer parts of the city in, in, in South Queens, uh, Staten Island, have, have two pipes in the street, one for sanitary sewage, one for storm flow. Much better. Um, also on Staten Island, we've developed the Blue Belt concept, these retainage basins that look like natural systems. So that, that's helped as well. Um, I do want to point out that during Ida, though, the rainfall uh, wasn't the same across all of the city. Um, you know, parts, parts of the areas got more, parts of the areas got less. So that goes into the equation as well. But um, having separate sewers certainly helps. Yeah, I mean, my district, two of the main neighborhoods in my district have names that include elevation, right? Bay Ridge, Diker Heights. Normally, uh, we're immune from, from storms. This time, I don't think there was a house in my district that didn't take on water of some kind. Um, I, so I want to move on, but, but so the answer then, what you're saying is the answer is not, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to synthesize this. We're saying that our, the city sewers are not built to, to, to sustain this much water, but isn't it crazy if we're installing those same sewers? Wouldn't we be trying to build a bigger tree using your analogy? 
and, and, and we are. So we, we've developed master sewer plans to, to try to do that. It's just not going to happen, you know, within the next year or two. Um, and, and again, in, in order to take steps very quickly, uh, we want to look at, at other things in the interim. Building out the, the, the sewer system, again, to be twice as big, maybe, maybe it's not even feasible because those pipes can't fit in the street, uh, you know, but we certainly want to make them bigger than they are today and build that tree out over the coming decade. Okay. Um, do you, I mean, I think one of the things we need to prioritize, and I hope you would agree, is that for constituents that, that tell us that they get flooded on a regular basis, much less on these once-in-a-lifetime storms that now happen three, three times a month, we've got to prioritize these projects because if, if we're getting flooding now in areas where... Um, most most homeowners had never seen flooding before. Then the homeowners that are seeing flood that have been seeing flooding all along, even sunny day you know sunny day flooding or just in a simple rainstorm, um, these are projects that just have to be prioritized. And I, I certainly have a bunch in my district. I'm sure my colleagues have several in their district. I understand we can't just wholesale replace all the sewers in the city, but I think for folks where we know they're going to get flooded. Um, we've got to prioritize those projects. So I hope we can, we can work together on that. Um, I want to ask about uh, backwater valves, something I didn't, had knew nothing about until about a month ago. Um, th these valves are used to prevent overflow as a result of backwater from a public sewer system coming into, coming into your house. During Ida, many basins were flooded from backwater from sewage, uh, sewage pipes because of the combined sewers. Um, does DEP have an inventory of how many buildings are protected from such overflows by having backwater valves installed? Mm -hmm. So just a backwater valve, you know, we, we think in many cases it does make sense for property. So just what are It does they? or it doesn't? No, we think it, they, it does. they do. They do. Okay. They do. Um, when there's flooding on, on a street from a heavy rain, water is going to seek its own level and it's going to, you know, push down through through uh, pipes, through the sewer connection from homes, and can come out in toilets and basements. And a backwater valve can help uh, to prevent that. So, so they're good in that way. The, the The issue is that the homeowner then has to maintain them. Otherwise, you're going to have worse problems. So, um, while we do recommend in certain cases that you install a backwater valve if you're in, a, in an area that traditionally floods. That the issue is is, is maintenance, and um, I don't know if we have an inventory, but if we do, I'll, I'll get that to you. Yeah, I mean, I think New Yorkers are always inclined to do their part and and their fair share. I think when it comes to um, taking on sewer water, I think that's where that that <laughs> that relationship ends. Um, and and if I may, uh, Jim yeah. Brandon, I just wanted to add that um, the city actually just received a federal grant. We want a federal grant to actually conduct a study of where and where where and when backwater valves work best in the city. So we had a program to install backwater valves in sandy affected areas. Um, we want to expand that program, and so our goal is to actually put some specific numbers to the number of buildings okay. um, that could benefit from from these and um, and what the cost of installation and maintenance, as Commissioner Sapienza mentioned, would be. Okay, because I know there are cities where, you know, for me, part of this is sort of lifting that veil of exceptionalism, right? I, this is the best city in the world. That's undisputed. But if other cities or, or, or states or countries are doing things better than we are, we need, to, we need to be unafraid to steal their ideas. And I see in other cities um, they're reimbursing homeowners for installation of, of backwater valves. So it seems like certainly if we have federal grant money, something we could be doing here, where I don't think that should be the responsibility of the homeowner as far as the, you know, the, the, the payment is concerned. Um, okay, I want to move along. because A lot of my colleagues have questions. I, I want to be respectful. Um, talking about flooding, um, the city and center of New York neighborhoods launched this uh, consumer education campaign called Flood Help New York, which was really helpful. It's provided flood risk information and support to homeowners who may, might not understand how this stuff works. Certainly I didn't. Um, do we know if this resource is just for residents in coastal areas or is it um, being expanded to inland areas? Uh, thanks for raising this, Chair Brennan. Um, th the program was fundi funded with post-Sandy federal dollars, and so it is limited at this time to um, coastal areas that were impacted by Sandy. Okay. And I guess this is broad, but what are the city's views on, on building homes and businesses in areas that 
regularly flood now? What are the city's views on constructing homes and businesses in areas that will regularly flood five, t five, 10, 20 years from now? So, you know, I think that um, we have been actively working to balance the um, affordable housing needs we have as a city um, with our resiliency needs. Um, we've started, um, it, so it's, it's both about how we build and where we build, right? Um, and, and so all new buildings right now have to incorporate Appendix G, which is one of the most flood resilient building codes in the entire nation. Um, and uh, we appreciate our partnership with council to make it that way. Um, if a building goes through substantial rehabilitation, it would do the same thing. Um, we've also started um, uh, sort of thinking about um, where we build and how we can uh, limit density in certain areas. In particular, the Department of City Planning has created a special zoning designation called Special Coastal Risk Districts, which limit density in the most flood prone areas. Um, so this is to account for the fact that these are places that are flooding on a regular basis. And we arrived at the zoning designation with intense participation from um, community residents. Um, we also appreciate council's partnership on uh, passing local law 41 um, that will mandate the climate resiliency design guidelines, which will take flood risk into account in all capital projects, including buildings projects. Um, so, you know, we're, we're incorporating these design changes to ensure flood resiliency um, while also taking into account the riskiest areas and um, applying special rules there. Thank you. Um, le last, last thing, the city released a stormwater resiliency plan and, and the stormwater maps back in May, I believe. Um, the maps show both moderate to severe flooding from rain. The areas that um, flooded during the recent uh, storms. How are they depicted on the flood maps? Did the maps predict the, the level of flooding that occurred? Um, yes, they did. There was a pretty significant overlap between the hardest hit areas and the stormwater flood maps. Um, specifically for the extreme scenario, there were two sets of maps um, that modeled two different scenarios. Um, and there was an overlap with the extreme scenario. Some of the places that um, were uh, shown on the maps um, that also were hit by um, the remnants of Ida include Central Queens, East Bronx, Central Brooklyn, and North Staten Island. And I know that the plan has goals and initiatives with, with some completion dates not until 2027 and 2031. Based on the, the past month of, of what we've seen over the past month, um, and what we know will continue to occur. Do we believe these timelines should be accelerated? Absolutely, I think the mayor has already acknowledged that the timeline should be accelerated and that's something that we're working through um, with the Extreme Weather Task Force. Okay, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna be respectful of my, my colleagues' time. Obviously, I mean, we wanna be partners in this. You know, I don't, think, I don't think it helps anyone to come here today and point fingers. Obviously, we wanna know what went wrong, also what went right. But I think the main thing is we just don't want to be back here again, right? I, I feel like um, sometimes it becomes deja vu all over again where, you know, I'm feeling like how many once in a lifetime things can I experience in a lifetime um, or in a week or in a month? Um, but we want to be partners in this work, certainly with my committee and the committees here today. So um, just to make sure that we're prepared for next time and that this doesn't happen again and that no pain, no gain. If people, you have to dig up streets to do sewer repairs, that's what we have to deal with. It's better than getting a basement full of, uh, of sewage. So I want to turn it back to uh, Chair Rodriguez. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Chair. Now let's turn it to Chair Gennaro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm gonna be, uh, let me just, uh, before I begin, uh, members of my committee who have been here uh, or are here, um, uh, Councilmember Ulrich was here. Uh, Councilmember Diaz is here, and I, uh, I, I welcome her as a member of the Environmental Protection Committee. <clears throat> I'm going to be following up on some of the point, points that um, Councilmember Brannon uh, or uh, Chair Brannon just uh, brought up uh, with regard to the capacity of the sewer system. Now, when I came on as a staff member of the Council, um, you know, for the Environmental Protection Committee 31 years ago, so I, I, I got back a long way with this stuff, <clears throat> uh, and. It's my understanding, this is, this is my own, uh, you know, my own memory, uh, that you know, once upon a time when the uh, sewer system was first established, it was uh, set at a threshold. Uh, of course, I'm directing this to, to Vinny. <clears throat> and and um, uh, um, 
that the sewer system had the capacity to process one inch per hour, and then there was a new standard of 1.5 inches per hour, and the current standard is 1.75 inches per hour, which is a lot of capacity. I, I don't know, I, I, you know, it would, it would be hard to, 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 um, to process more than that uh, in, in an hour, but my question that I'm getting at is, is that we probably have part of the city that has the ability to do one inch, and part 1.5 and part 1.75. Does DEP um, have any sense of like what percentage is at like the higher 1.75 capacity versus the 1.5 versus the one? Is that is that a known? Is that a known thing? Mr. Chair, yes. Yeah, so I'll just uh, address that. So when the sewer systems were originally built, going back to the time before the consolidation of Greater New York, and then right after, um, the the sewers were under the jurisdiction of each borough president, and so the designs were different. There was no right. citywide standard for a long time. So you do have some pockets of lesser than 1.75 inches per hour, but for the last 50 years, that's been the standard. And the oh, for 50 years, so yeah. 50 years has been 1.75. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and so how much of the city is at 1.75? We'll get to that number. I don't have that off top. Yeah. And now, is it the case that when you have, you know, part of the city that's at the higher standard of 1.75 feeds into another area of the city or another branch of the tree that you get bottlenecks, you get problems as these, mm -hmm. it's kind of like you have a highway, it's got four lanes or, you know, three lanes, and then you open it up to four lanes, it goes back to three lanes again, and, you know, you get a little jammed up. Is that a phenomenon, or is the 1.75 capacity, you know, kind of like on its own network and it all flows smoothly, or is it still kind of like a patchwork where you get bottlenecks here and there, and they're, you know, and and they tend to be problem areas? Is that is that is that what exists? Hey, Chair, you know, we've done much better. I'm going to say over the last 20 or 30 years in reducing what was a large number of bottlenecks. I won't say they're all gone, um, but right. we we have done a, a really good job. Um, particularly in the Jamaica drainage area over the last right. 10 years or so. Uh, and now let's get to um, overall capacity. Um, uh, I'm a geologist, but not an engineer. Uh, you know, can you foresee uh, a, 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 um, uh, a New York City sewer system that has a capacity of more than 1.75 inches per hour? We're starting to get into some pretty big numbers here. If we're going into like two inches per hour, I mean, that's huge. And so what, what is DEP's thinking regarding how big we can build in terms of inches processed per hour? Yeah, and it's a great question because we know in some Of course local, it's a great question. Local, I asked the question. Local, local, you know, narrow, narrow streets that are, you know, 25, 30 feet wide, it's tough to get a much bigger sewer uh, beneath there with with everything else with electric gas and it, it, it you start probably beyond two inches an hour to hit uh, the maximum size on many residential streets um, but again that's why we want to look at other things keeping stormwater out of the, the system in the first place with with green infrastructure with retention with more porous pavement we have to use all the tools in the toolbox not just the traditional hard pipe so we're looking at uh, a build out of 1.75 with a, a, a thought of perhaps there could be greater capacity in certain areas. Is that, is that like a fair assessment? Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> and, uh, and now regard to uh, sewer replacement over time and getting to those areas that are still less than the standard of, of you know, 1.75, uh, we got 7,500 miles of uh, 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 sewer lines, uh, um, as per your testimony, and if we're going to like revamp the system entirely, kind of like you know rebuild it um, over the course of like what's the lifetime of, of, of a sewer of a sewer main? Is it like 100 years? So so let's just let's just pull a number out of the air and say, you know, 100 years we want to completely redo the system. That would mean that we'd have to do 75 miles of new sewer mains a year. I don't think we're doing that, right? 
I don't think we're doing anything yeah. any close to that. No, I mean, we, we do, uh, we're do, adding a lot of storm sewers right now. Um, the older part of the sewer system, we actually do replacements along with replacing old water mains and, and streets. We work coordinate with DOT and, and DDC to do that work. Um, I don't know if we're quite at 75 miles, but we, we, we do a lot of, of replacements, but we do much more uh, mileage of, of new storm sewers. Yeah, because, because, because my thought, both with the water mains, which is not the subject of today's hearings, and also with the, with the sewer mains, I think the idea is to figure out, you know, how many years you want to completely turn the system over, and then, you know, divide that by 100, and then that's what you ought to be doing every year, you know, ideally. Um, and so, and just a, you know, just a note to committee council, uh, uh, Samara, I, I just think we're looking at uh, um, uh, Samara and oversight hearing, because I don't want to go too deep into the weeds on this and take up everyone's time. Uh, but it's, it's going to be on, on, on the capacity of the sewer system, how we're building it out, uh, and also on the uh, stormwater management plan, which is my next uh, line of question here, although I, I, I will I, I'll, I'll try not to take too much time. So, uh, uh, Director Bavishi and, 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 and you, Commissioner, made reference to the release of the final stormwater management plan uh, this year. I'm holding Local Law 5, from which, which I authored back in 2008, and that law states that the, so this was passed, passed on, passed in January, signed in February, and it had a, a date of uh, October 1st, 2008, for a draft plan, and two months after the release of the draft plan, but no later than December 1st, 2008, the final plan was due. So it's, it's 13 years late. Am I, am I, am I getting that wrong? I think we're mixing up two things. There was a more recent local law passed um, specifically related to stormwater resiliency. That is the plan that was released earlier this year, the stormwater resiliency plan. I think, um, Chair Gennaro, the uh, local law you're referencing is a-, uh, a It's, it's kind of hard to, you gotta like shout right into the thing. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, it's better. Okay, um, I, I just said that I, th I think we're mixing up two things. Um, there was a more recent local law passed requiring a stormwater resiliency plan that takes climate um, uh, risks into account. Um, and that's the plan that was released earlier this year. Um, the, I think the local law that you're referencing is a more general stormwater management plan, which um, I'm hoping Commissioner Sapienza can speak to. Yeah, because I, 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 um, I was on the internet last night and I saw a uh, you know 2012 you know update to the plan, but I I I, I couldn't find the final plan mm -hmm. online. So I, I I had the original one, like the draft, which is got all wrapped up in Plan YC, and it was a huge you know a, a huge document put out in you know 2008. So like the draft happened. And then there was an update in 2012, and that's where like the trail goes cold. And so, um, uh, uh, and, but I'm, you know, this is to say that um, uh, you know there, 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 there's laws that I write and pass, there's plans that have to get made, but then there's you know actual work that has to happen. And I think the work is more important than like the pieces of paper it, 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 it's printed on, but. Um, it, it's important that we, uh, you know, move these projects as, you know, quickly as possible. And I'm all for the green stuff. I was the guy that wrote this bill. And so, you know, I, I, I want all the bioswales, all the stuff, all the, uh, you know, rain gardens, uh, you know, even though my constituents hate them and, uh, and, 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 and we have to do that. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about a storm like this, we really got to build the system out uh, fully. And speaking of building out the system fully, what is the, uh, and, 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 and uh, I think my colleague, Council, uh, 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 Councilman Miller, may have something to say about this as well. Uh, you know, how much of Southeast Queens has no storm sewer capacity at all at the moment, right now, today? So I don't have that number for you, uh, Mr. Chair, but uh, you know, as mentioned earlier, the mayor made a major commitment to, to Southeast Queens. Um, the, the system was built with sanitary sewers, but but uh, certainly a lack, or if no, no right. <clears throat> storm sewers, and and the community has suffered flooding since 
You know, it's been built in the you know, 1940s and 50s. There were a lot of natural streams in Southeast Queens that drained that area that were filled in by you know, unscrupulous real estate developers who subsequently sold that land for, uh, for residential development. And we've now, working with uh, the Department of Design and Construction, have been installing those storm sewers over the last few years. A lot of work, $2 billion. Um, we, you know, we've heard from, from Council Member Miller uh, and other elected officials in the area that the, the, the system is now working in certain areas, but there's still a lot to do. Yeah, but this is something that I made a big deal about during the budget hearings because when I was chairman left, I left, I left the council in 2013, <clears throat> I was making a big deal about the Southeast Queens build out then. And that was, well, my hair was all black and I had a 34 inch waist, you know, so. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still having the same argument, and I, 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 or the same, or, or, or the same conversation. I certainly appreciate, uh, you know, the you know, huge commitment by the mayor, but the people of Southeast Queens, uh, you know, have, have no storm sewer capacity whatsoever. And 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 uh, and 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 in in next year's budget presentation, I, I I think we have to have a date certain for when all of Southeast Queens is going to be built out. It just it's just you know unacceptable not to have that uh, in this um, um, you know in, in this time of uh, uh, um, frequent storms. So we'll get to that, that. So, the that, so I, I, that's a nod. So let the record show that he's saying yes. Okay. Um, and um, uh, Chairman Brown was also talking about the uh, about the check valves. Uh, I, I am um, introducing a bill. We'll see where it goes. Uh, um, uh, Twenty-five years ago, you know, we did the toilet rebate program. Uh, you know, the city felt it was in the interest of you know, you know, water conservation to make an investment to put. You know, fixtures in private homes. I'm, the, I, I participated in that program. I, I, I got a new toilet, you know, 1.6 gallons. It like you know replaced one that was 3.2, and it was great. And so, and we went from bringing down a billion and a half gallons a year from upstate New York to like a little under a billion is what we're is what we're living on now. And so it was a huge success, but we had to spend money to do it. Uh, now the now, now the backflow prevention devices are a little trickier because, you know, if the homeowner w you know, wants to have one, there is a maintenance responsibility. Uh, but people who have sewer lines, like, like, like I do, I make sure I get it snaked on a regular basis and I, you know, keep it clean. And they would have to know that just because the city put it in doesn't mean that they're going to come back and maintain it. But with that said, um, you know, what I would like to see following up on what uh, um, uh, um, Chairman Brannon made mention of and wrote an op-ed about recently, um, I, I, I want to make that a law and something I want to, uh, 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 and, and uh, um, Samara, maybe we can tie this in with, um, with the oversight hearing we want to have on the, on the um, stormwater management plan and the, and the build out of the sewer system. Um, but this is something that I, you know, that I, I because my, my, my district, every home, including mine, had a sewer backup and my house sits up. So for that, so so for that, you know, at, at quite an angle. For I've I've, I've owned the house 30 years, I, I've you know, never had a sewer backup. Um, that's why I never got a check valve, and I, I didn't think I needed one. Now I need one, um, and I'm not doing this bill to get a check valve for free. I'll put my own in. Okay, <laughs> just letting you know. But <clears throat> uh, I, I I think is I mean you, until we do the ultimate build out and even when we do the build out it's going to be 1.75 inches you know if it's a miracle it'll be like two inches per hour but we're going to get storms greater than that which means we're going to be living with backups like as far as the eye can see that's bad news but that's just reality and you know there is a fix for it it's not 100 percent but you know, uh, I, I've been speaking with the Plumbing Foundation and other people and you know, people at DEP, and they, they, they do a, a you know, pretty good job. And so um, this is something that I think the city kind of has to, you know, I think, you know, has to pursue this. And also, you know, the city gets claims uh, that go through the controller's office every time someone gets a sewer backup. So the city, I, I tried to figure out the number. I tried to, to, to reach out to the controller to figure out how much the city is paying out in claims for sewer backups, and if everyone has a has a you know backflow prevention device, then those claims go away. The city saves money, and people don't get their basements, you know, full of sewage. And so um, I know you can't 
you know, have, you, you, know, uh, 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 in, in, you know, detailed comments on, on, on a bill that hasn't even been, you know, written yet, but just, you know, conceptually, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so we're happy to, you know, provide whatever information and, and uh, collaborate with you on, on crafting uh, the legislation, uh, you know, I think as Janie said, right. there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah, because uh, we, we we're, 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 you know, hearing about federal money or whatever, and if, if there's a pot of money from which, you know, to do this, I think, I think that would be, uh, I think that would be great. So thank you for that. Let me see if I have any, anything else. Uh, I'm just going to get a, a little parochial um, uh, on the um, Utopia Corridor in my district, which was a real disaster. This is going back to the, you know, to like the, you know, the early 2000s. Uh, you know, I met with Jim Roberts, who, who, who was a deputy commissioner at the time, and he had this concept of like the high-level sewers, and you know, so and you know, nothing ever happened. Fast forward seven years, I'm back, and cars were floating on Utopia Parkway. You know, once again, and I don't really too parochial because. Everyone knows the bad spots, and so you know, and and you know, you know, to the extent that these you know mitigation me measures, um, you know, regarding, uh, I mean, I'm going to ask for something. I mean, I I I I am going to ask DEP to 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 you know, give me some sort of document that you know talks about the areas that flood on a regular basis. And, uh, and, and, and you know, what is the plan for putting in these sort of local mitigation matter measures that are essentially, you know, outside the tree, so to speak, because they don't feed into the main system. You know, they, uh, and uh, that's something I really think that I, I, I you know, need to see because I, I, I'm a, and, you know, God bless your staff. I mean, I was on, I, 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 you know, I was on the phone with, you know, Mike Deloche at one in the morning the other day, you know, you know trying to get a, like a block. So, so I mean, I, I couldn't say nice enough things about your staff and, you know, you got Angela I've been working with forever and, 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 and all the good people uh, um, of your team. But I mean, I, 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 I uh, think that we have to put this on paper and we gotta take a serious look at how we can get this stuff in the budget so that uh, places like Utopia Parkway, I'm just using that as an example, don't get, you know, don't get, you know, really devastated um, on a regular basis. And- uh, Happy to get that to you. Sure. And uh, with that, uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, I uh, yield. Thank you, Chairman. Gonna be, now we're gonna be putting the clock in I'm going to be in, uh, first uh, giving the opportunity to Antonio Reynoso as the chairman of the Sanitation Committee and then following by Council Member Levine. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair, um, for this uh, timely hearing. Um, you know, to be honest, I really feel that we could have had this hearing four years ago. Um, a lot of folks have been talking about climate change and how it's going to affect us being the largest city or the greatest city. Uh, in the world, we would hope that this time would never come because we would be prepared. Um, I want to be honest with the questioning that came from Council Member Brannon uh, to the DEP Commissioner um, and understanding the complexities of being able to build out an entirely new sewer system. Um, uh, it, it still feels like we're kind of writing off the opportunity to, to start solving for um, uh, a system that is more, that I can do better. Uh, this supplemental work is also going to take a long time. Um, and so we, all we have is time, I guess, at this point to start building things out as of now. Is there a master plan, um, which I think you alluded to, is there a, mass, a master plan to do better with the sewer system? And what does that mean in terms of built out capacity once it's completed. Yeah, thanks for the, the question. Um, you know, the DEP has a, a very large and robust capital program. It's uh, t the t our 10 year plan is $24 billion. So we spent a lot of money both on, on sewers and on, on the water system as well. Um, but all of that gets funded through people who pay water bills. And I know we, we come, you know, to this chamber a couple of times a year for preliminary budget hearings and, and exec budget hearings. 
We talk about how much we want to spend, how much water rates are going to have to get increased. We hear from the public how, you know, that would be a disaster for, for them, for their affordability, and we get it. So there's always a balance about how much more work we can do. We'd love to do more, um, and we're hopeful that the federal government will have a large uh, infrastructure program and we can get some funding from that. All right. So, so then this comes to, and I'm glad that everyone's here, to planning and sustainability. Um, what, uh, if not, uh, more what what is the infrastructure we're talking about here related to DEP sewer system and the flooding issues that we we have are very important why is it that the city of New York isn't uh, pouring money into arguably the most important um, issue of our time which is climate change um, just why is the DEP concerned about money um, when um, if not handled or taken care of we have loss of life for residents uh, and significant long-term structural damage um, to homes, uh, to businesses, um, and to our local city infrastructure. So if not, you know, what, what is planning and sustainability of not to address that issue um, and, and cover the cost uh, of this work? Uh, well, we're spending over $20 billion in our resiliency program citywide. Um, as I said- 20 right billion over how many years? Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't have that figure right now. It's, um, it, it's a mix of federal uh, and local funding for the most part. Um, and, and we, um, as I said in my uh, testimony, we're, we're preparing for a range of hazards, right? Um, New York City is at risk from coastal storms, sea level rise, stormwater, and, and intense precipitation like we saw with the remnants of Ida as well as extreme heat. All of these different challenges require different solution sets and we're advancing them in parallel with each other. Um, you know, I will be the first to say that resiliency is a process, it's not an outcome. So we, are, we still have much more work to do and we will continue to move forward aggressively. I also just wanna mention, as I've said, um, in response to previous questions and in my testimony, and I think Commissioner Sapienza has been hitting this point as well, that we can't rely on the sewer system alone to mitigate our risk from intense precipitation. We really have to pair our investments in the sewer system with other solutions, including green infrastructure and what we're calling cloud burst management practices. These, these are specific management practices for heavy downpour, like we saw with Ida, converting open spaces, streetscapes, green spaces into areas that can store stormwater um, and, and essentially uh, you know, uh, pr provide places for the water to go so that it's not going into the sewer system itself. So, so in, in the effort to, to allow for other colleagues to ask questions, it's just um, on two parts. The city council is constantly moving forward with uh, uh, attempting to pass uh, meaningful climate change legislation and we constantly get a watered down or a pushback approach from the administration regarding how aggressive we should or should not be regarding changes to building codes, um, expansion of uh, green infrastructure, um, making sure we're talking about significant lead programs in the building out of, of these buildings, uh, car infrastructure and the over reliance of vehicles um, in our city, um, you know, expanding a bike lane in the Brooklyn Bridge for six feet as opposed to having a, an expanded lane on either side in an effort to accommodate drivers, which also affects climate change. We're always getting pushed back from the mayor's office. So it might not be something that uh, in the short term we pay attention to, but long term, all those decisions are making it more and more difficult for us to protect our residents. And I'm talking about loss of life here, and I want to make sure that that is not lost upon us. And the last thing I would say is um, tree pits. Um, we do these bioswells in some parts of the neighborhoods. There's no reason why when we replace or insert a tree pit, it is not a bioswell. Why isn't that basic infrastructure that makes significant changes or could as assist us, why is it every time we're replacing a tree, we're expanding tree uh, lot sizes, why not make them all bioswells? Or is that also yeah. a cost issue? Or is it a, um, a problem uh, because of a, in, another infrastructure issue that we may have? Yeah, I, 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 question. Thank yeah, you so much. I, get, I could address that just, just quickly. And, and we are looking at putting rain gardens, bioswales, wherever we can in the, in the city. We've already put 11,000 of them. In some areas, it's just we not, have, we, yeah. There was a one million tree project that was put yeah. forth by Mayor Bloomberg. One million trees. And we're talking about how many bioswales as if it is, if, as if it is yeah. a significant number. 11,000 to one million is almost, it was, it's almost statistically irrelevant and insignificant. So I just want to ask, 
Why is it that when we have an opportunity to install infrastructure that is meaningful, that we're not taking advantage of that? Why right. is it not parallel to the work that we're no, doing? No, and, and, and I'll answer that because in, in some areas, in many areas, um, the subsurface just isn't feasible for, for a rain garden. There may be rock, so it's not permeable. What is that number? There may be. There what may is that be, number, Commissioner? So yeah. <laughs> these numbers, $20 billion, and you don't have a timeline as to when you're going to spend that billion dollars. That could be over 20 years. It's a billion dollars a year. It makes it yeah. less, uh, less it, significant. But when it comes to this, how many of our cheap pits are incapable of becoming biosols because of the infrastructure issues you're talking uh, about? Uh, you know, I, I, so I, I, I want to say we've, 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 rolled out, we've rolled out the most aggressive green infrastructure program in the United States. We have 11,000 rain gardens we've built. We continue to build more. We'll, we will look at all tree pits, but in, in many cases, it's just, it's on the wrong part of the street. You're not gonna get the runoff. It, it, there's, there's a lot we look at okay. to build those engineered subsystems. Look, I wanna be helpful, like all of us here wanna be helpful, but this idea that we're doing enough is not, is not the way we should be approaching no one No one said we're doing enough. You're, we know we need to do more. The most aggressive climate change, whatever, in the country, that is, an, that is a, 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 a submission here that we're doing enough or that we are the best. We're way behind. Climate change is real. My kids, our next generation is going to suffer through this. So I can't accept that the standard that we're setting forth to solve for climate change is something that is just the best in this country. It should be enough or effective or sufficient enough to solve the actual problem. Till we get there, which we are not, then I don't care what number you are in rankings regarding to like uh, how successful you now, think that. If we've given that impression that we think we're doing enough, we're, we know we're not, we know we need to do more, we know investments have to come from, from elsewhere to get there, that's okay. the point. Thank you, I appreciate Thank that. You. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair. Councilmember Levine, followed by Councilmember Holden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually want to follow up with some of the excellent points that uh, my colleague, Chair Reynoso, was just making. Um, Director Bavishi, you said uh, very well that it's not enough only to upgrade and modernize our sewer system. We have to keep water from going into the sewer system in the first place, and that's this green infrastructure that Chair Reynoso and, and many on the panel have been speaking about today. Um, there's, there's a map uh, on the DEP's website, DEP Green Infrastructure Program map, I'm sure you know it, has nice green and yellow dots uh, and blue dots everywhere you have a green infrastructure project. I think I see about, I don't know, 25 in Manhattan out of the 11,000. Is the map incomplete or has Manhattan largely been left untouched? No, uh, Council Member, we, we've been focusing primarily on areas uh, where there are water quality impacts. Um, th through now, we've looked at where we can reduce the amount of runoff into the combined sewer system that ultimately during storms could overflow untreated wastewater into water bodies uh, like Newtown Creek or Bowery Bay. So that's been the, the focus so far. Um, Manhattan also presents other challenges just for the permeability of the soils, what's underneath. So. That, but we, we, we want to flood all five boroughs with as many bioswales uh, as possible. There may have been a time when we didn't understand that Manhattan could flood, but certainly after this summer, we understand that even elevated areas like Washington Heights are incredibly pr prone to flooding. When the flooding's coming from above, not just from the river or the ocean, nowhere is safe. And particularly in the hilly terrain of uptown Manhattan, uh, we have seen a level of flooding that it's, it's miraculous no one has died. You've seen the video. The threat is very real. There's no part of the city that is immune from the threat of extreme weather, weather heavy rain events, and flooding. And as the council member, as, as Chair Reynoso said, uh, I think there are 600,000 street trees in New York City. Uh, do you know how many of them currently have bioswales under them? I don't. It's probably at best in the hundreds, if I'm not mistaken, maybe in the low thousands. At, that's probably overly optimistic. So measured against the scale of the potential, we have barely begun, barely begun this project and leaving large parts of the city uh, most of the Bronx or the South Bronx and Northwest Bronx also similarly largely unimpacted by this project so far. 
another way to measure our progress is, I guess, the portion of stormwater that's being diverted by this infrastructure. Can you give us an estimate on that? We have that. We, we put out a, um, a, a green infrastructure report. I, I don't have the details on the top of my head, but uh, we, we can get it out of our annual report, which is But online. it's probably still, what, single-digit small, single small percent? For sure. So, so as, and my time is up and I'll, I'll wrap up, but as, as Chair Reynoso said, measured against the scale of the crisis, measured against the potential to put an upside to this, a city of 700,000 street trees, 800 playgrounds or more, uh, we have huge potential to divert billions of gallons of water from going into our sores to eliminate flooding, to eliminate overflow into the rivers, which is a, a sanitary disaster, as you know. And uh, I think you're hearing from us the urgency and uh, doing far more than we've done today. None of what we have done is enough. And we need now to think bigger than ever in the midst of a climate change disaster, which is already here. Um, we need to do more, and we're gonna continue to push for that. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Member. And, and before calling Council Member Holden, you know, as I said before, when I mentioned the two particular locations in Riverside Drive and Seaman Avenue down the Fort Triumph Park, Nago Avenue and Dykeman under the Highbridge Park, that's a typical example of what the council members say. Two years that I will have this month, next two months from now, two years that I've been preaching day by day to the administration, to agency. And now we're raining, the water is accumulated there. And probably the approach is that. Manhattan is taking care about where. So even though I say at the beginning, I say I don't want to bring the question because that's a fact. I want to be able to work closer with you and see how we can, we can pay closer attention to locations such as those two. The higher point of Manhattan is in Washington Heights, a six floor building at the George Washington High School give you the view of the World Trade Center and the Tampa Sea Bridge. We have six hundreds of acres of land. We all those park together. Har and Council Member used to be the chairman of the committee park. Harvest Park, Fort Triumph Park, and Inwood Park. And I don't think that we as a city has given attention to those particular challenges. So I hope again, working with you in the time that we are reminding and the role that you continue playing, that we can really pay attention because for me this is about why we have not fixed it because that's not a mainly middle class, yeah. upper class community. No, and, and, and the point you both bring out about uh, hilly terrain with, with more intense rainfall means more water coming down uh, you know, from those hillsides into lower drainage areas, it makes it even more challenging. Those type of situation. You go to Nago, they say eight or nine, many of the restaurants there. So again, like, and for me it's about your team and our team in the city, we know about it. And that's why the level of frustration, that's why we, at the same time that we want to continue working collaboration. But I say, oh, Manhattan has not been priority, and I don't want no one from the Upper West Side, from the Upper East Side to be dealing with flooding as we do in the other part of Manhattan. But sometimes when we take the approach of Manhattan, we go down, we look at down 96th Street. We don't look at El Barrio, we don't look at the other part. So I just hope that, you know, with you and the other agency, we definitely should be paying close attention in the time that we are reminded. And of course, we will continue working hard with the future administration to, to address those issues of inequality that has a face of any superstorm, of any storm, of any raining that will affect the city of New York. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. Uh, Commissioner Grayson, I want to 
congratulate you and, and praise your men and women who did a great job uh, in the days after the storm and continue to do a great job. Um, just have a, you know, a few things on, uh, I believe a lot of this, uh, obviously it's, it's the super storms that we're seeing, but a lot of this is also self-inflicted. And, and I'll explain that. Overdevelopment. We've seen overdevelopment for decades. And every time a community like mine or a district like mine tries to fight it, um, we tell the developers, well, our sewer system is not going to take this. And the city always comes back, city planning, and um, BSA, they always say, no, it's fine. And it's not fine. And we've seen accident, you know, obviously we have accident prone locations in traffic and DOT, but we have flood prone locations here in, with DEP that historically doesn't need a superstorm to flood. Cooper Avenue underpass in, in my district, the, the water was up to the balcony here. Uh, it could have killed people. Uh, basements, apartments, which I have a lot, uh, we report them, nothing happens. Nothing happens. It just, we can't gain access or we just don't have the resolve to correct it. Like the mayor said, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't find them. Well, I, I beg to differ because it does. Illegal apartments actually test the sewer system a lot. And you know that, Commissioner. You've seen that. Uh, just like um, community drives, which I have a lot of in my district, those get flooded because essentially the city allowed those designs uh, in, the, in the past and then we continue to pay the price. But there's no, there doesn't seem to be a task force, which I had recommended, and I have a bill for this, where multiple agencies respond to these locations and try to correct it. Uh, paving over properties, we, we came up with, with a law against that and yet it's really not enforced. I, I put that in my newsletter every few months. I have, don't pave over your property to create new parking. Uh, it's, a, it's a big problem. We're creating these rain gardens, but we're not enforcing people, you know, really paving over their properties to the point we're exacerbating the sewer system. And we need to identify the locations that are flood prone and then descend on them to try to solve it yeah, rain gardens, it, it, literally it's a drop in the bucket. Obviously, I know that. But we need to enforce regulations and not, re, you know, not tell people, and tell people, don't pave over your property. If you do, you'll get fined. Because it is going to hurt your neighbors, hurt the city, and, and actually flood the areas. But we're not correcting the flood-prone locations, really not. And my district will have sewer projects uh, uh, for 50 years and still not catch up because of overdevelopment and because of illegal apartments. And that's the, but again, we keep approving building projects in our, in our city that can't tolerate, obviously, or the, or the sewer system can't, cannot uh, take the capacity. And that's historic. So I, I, I would just like to ask you about what we could, because you mentioned this in the beginning, about addressing the community driveways, which are a huge, huge problem. Thanks, Council Member. So I'll, I'll address a few things. So first, um, just talking about how much of the this city is now impervious. And um, you know, as Janie mentioned, some of the things we're doing to look at are retention basins, um, the new unified storm ru water rule that's, that's being developed will require uh, new developments to do on-site. Uh, storage, so that's one thing. Um, we, we have a study underway to look at ways of billing um, property owners to, to essentially disincentivize them to, to, to pave over lots, so that's underway as well. The community drives, you know, certainly that was uh, brought to, to, you know, the top of the, the list during Ida. Um, a lot of these driveways are, you know, essentially below grade uh, to, to provide access to garages that are, are at basement levels, and now many of those garages are living spaces, and uh, there, there's just insufficient drainage. There were private property people put in. We saw seepage basins, uh, dry wells, obviously not enough to handle the flow. Uh, the mayor asked us to, under this 30-day this plan, to take a look at those to see how best we can provide drainage uh, for those, those backyard alleys. But, but do we have, like, to address that, yeah, we have a plan or we will try to come up with a plan, but we're getting to a point where 
Even thunderstorms, normal summer thunderstorms, are flooding those locations. So what I'm saying is it's not, yeah, it's, it's not just uh, to, uh, addressing super you know, storms. It's really the design of the, the community drives are a problem. And then at, at this point, with the super storms, they're jeopardizing people's lives. And so we need to address this, but have like um, a date where it'll, you'll come back and say, this is what we have to try. And if it needs extra funding from the city or the city council, we can address that. But there, there are many districts around the city that have community drives, and they are a design flaw in some low-lying areas. And, and certainly drainage is a big problem. But again, a joint effort from all the agencies, your agency, uh, uh, Department of Buildings, uh, Sanitation, uh, all, the lo all these uh, agencies coming together and forming a, a solution to address especially the uh, flood-prone locations. And just one other thing. You look at the LIE today, the Long Island Expressway. They have dozens of catch basins that are totally clogged with dirt. They haven't been cleaned in, it looks like, years. There's trash all alongside the expressway. No other city has this. No other large city has such a problem with trash, especially do, uh, on our arterial highways. Who's responsible for cleaning those cash basins on the, let's say, the expressways? So we've been working with city and state DOT to make sure that those catch basins are, are cleaned on a more regular basis. We've also, D DEP and our contractors have been, and you may see them out on the, uh, on the Long Island Expressway, these large, what we call vector trucks, cleaning, cleaning out that material. Um, it, it's, it's a challenge. People, for whatever reason, throw garbage out of their, their windows as they're driving, and it's, J it's... Just go to, just west of Maurice Avenue on the LIE under, which, which, where it's under the, the larger um, six lane. Uh, LIE, clogged for years, trash for years. Dirt has built up so much, it's clogged. So this is the problem that we're facing all over the city. So we need to be proactive rather than reactive all the time. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Council Member Cabrera, now we have the next three, the last three council members, Rose, Miller, Rose, and Cook. And then after they ask a question, we will have the MTA uh, who are ready, waiting for them to take the second part of this hearing to hear on what happened there from the perspective of public transportation. Councilman Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon uh, to the panel. Thank you for, for being here to some of our uh, partners and and, and I, I, I as one who who lives and represents a, a a designated flood area one who has experienced all of the phenomenons that we're we're talking about here today in in, in southeast queens and the the the, the uh, check valves and the sump pump investments and all those things that just had not worked for years i, I i'm here to to at least attest to um the fact that the, invest, the recent investment in Southeast Queens for the most part has worked, that uh, in areas such as Cambria Heights and, and St. Albans and Springfield Gardens and even Rosedale, um, after the last two storms that, that members of the community are, are really uh, talking about the fact that the traditional flooding places had not flood, right? And that, that has been a measure when when you live in a community that, that traditionally floods and, and uh, it has been a big issue. So we are very appreciative of that. But you cannot quantify the success of such a program when you measure it against the loss of life. And, and unfortunately, uh, we had that in the district as well. And, and the most unfortunate part that it occurred in, and probably on the infamous 183rd Street. And I don't want you, uh, Commissioner uh, Sapienza, to, to, to really get into the details of that uh, so much um, as to talk about, uh, number one, how do, how do we uh, uh, support families that have been impacted in a way uh, uh, and, and, and on me through, through coordination of services and where are we now and what do they need now? I know we talked about uh, uh, early um, 
uh, Red Cross and other folks coming in, but there are folks who still don't have places to live that are food insecure without power and gas and things of that nature there. So I want to talk about agency uh, coordination, but there's also a, 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 a reality that in these areas um, that continually flood, that have flooded, quite frankly, for you know that low-lying area there goes back more than a century. And I don't believe that there's much that we can do and, and whether or not we continue to pour money into this black hole and has the city and his engineering expertise come out and, 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 and take a real hard, realistic look about where we develop uh, in the future, but also uh, can we allow our residents to now um, be jeopardized in such a way, in a life-threatening way, and are we taking a hard look at potentially condemning, building a park, and, and, and relocating families throughout the city? Um, specifically, you know, um, you know, obviously that's the Southeast Queens issue, and if we can talk about agency coordination, providing services, um, and, and, and how that happens, because we've been reaching out to the traditional hotspots and nothing's happened, but on a regular, last night I got a call that Allen Senior facility has 10 feet of water and the elevators aren't working and they're food insecure. And, you know, like, how, how do we know these things? Are they 311 calls? What does that coordination look like? And, and how do we provide these services for these families? Yeah, sir, so I'll take that one. Um, so after every disaster, our main focus is the people, right? The property, um, although it's devastating for folks, we wanna make sure that the people are taken care of. So as I mentioned in my testimony, we immediately started doing outreach in these communities uh, at multiple, multiple agency level. Uh, even the NYPD going door to door, uh, and I'm sure the chief can speak to that as well. Um, we have services available immediately after the storm for everybody, from hotels to transportation to our service centers to food uh, to human, uh, mental health services, language access. Uh, all of these things have been available since the day after the storm. As you mentioned, the challenge is making sure that we get to everybody, making sure that we are partnered with our community-based organizations, with our faith-based organizations, with our um, uh, with you all, right, with our political leaders. We need to make sure that anybody who has constituents has an understanding of what services are available and how do we get them uh, to them immediately. Um, we know in some of these hardest hit areas, um, some people are resistant and they don't want to leave their home, even if they don't have utilities. And we continually go out there and do outreach to them to try and convince them that we have everything they need right now uh, between the Red Cross providing hotels and even the Red Cross providing uh, gift cards in real time to people to just if they have to buy new clothes or shoes. So all of these things are available um, for people right now. If there are, you know, constituents of yours that need additional support, uh, I believe you mentioned something about a facility having 10 feet of water. We can take care of that immediately if uh, they need pumping out and Vinny's teams have, have done a great job with that. So I hope, I hope that answers your question. Okay, I'm, I'm certainly going to hold you to that because that is a senior facility and, and, uh, and uh, the, the, both elevators are out and, and, and that is something that I hope. That if you, if you give us that address now, we will have yeah, some. Yeah, absolutely, we will. And, and I want to say that, that we did go to door to door, the commissioner was out and, 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 and we're very thankful for that, but there, there are folks that, and if I may um, chair, and I'll just leave with this, uh, a text that I got from a resident early this morning that it's useless. I, I spent four hours at Queens College and all the agencies told me was call 311. I went there, I'm very disappointed. I'm having stress and that elected officials are not doing anything at all to help us. They're just doing, you know, and everybody's showing up every day, but nothing's happening. We are still fending for ourselves. I have personally kept my family safe, figure out how to keep them standing. Uh, in this house and all talk over the last 13 days went, I could not get a single agency to show up and do anything to help us. This is, this is what's happening in the district. Aside from that, that particular location, you know, we were there and the infrastructure is just bad. You know, when, when this happens, uh, 
summer after summer that, that is just sitting under water and you know we were in the house and 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 uh buildings came by and and and, and vacated it because the infrastructure was so bad because of the damage not only the damage they've been doing work and and ultimately you know probably uh did further exasperated the damage to the infrastructure over there how 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 do we get this support to these families in a in a real time way and and um we've been uh working with various agencies but again when when people come out and they have you know f filling out a paper for a comptroller in the long term you know is 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 not helping folks they need more immediate services and and um you know hopefully we can have better coordination in doing so so i and i know we, we have to wait on the mta so I'll, I'll just leave it at that so councilmember rose by so followed by councilmember kuhn david David, you want to use that one? If you want. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to first start by publicly thanking the Sanitation Department for their immediate response to clean up and to collect the debris from, um, from the homeowners. Um, it, it really uh, made a big difference. And um, I, I want to echo Council Member Reynoso's um, remarks that we remember about this event um, is not just about content. It is about the loss of life and that we, we have to do whatever we can to prevent, you know, a reoccurrence of this. And so I'm really concerned about um, that we are, we are pitting communities against each other, those that have more clout, influence, finances, and, um, or just scream louder that, you know, um, they're going to get um, a more immediate response and, um, to, uh, and what is going to be needed to remediate the situation. So I'm asking all of the agencies to address this through an equity lens and that um, you know, it's handled equitably and in a timely manner. Um, I want to thank uh, Chair Brennan for addressing the backwater valve issue um, because to me this seems to be um, something that we can do sooner rather than later, it's sort of a short-term goal versus long-term solutions. And so I, I really would like to hear whether the city will take this on as a project fund it, and, um, and then educate the public about um, how to maintain it so that we don't get a, a reoccurrence of, of that um, backwater. Um, and also, um, in my district, uh, there needs to be an installation of more storm drains. We have blocks, really long blocks, where there's one storm drain or none. And um, it was predicated on, um, on uh, gravity and how the street was actually banked so that the water would run off to somewhere. Um, but uh, since it's been repaved many iterations over, that, that grading does no longer exist. And so we have an um, inordinate uh, inordinate number of uh, amount of water that's pooling in in these places and to have one storm drain on a street is not adequate and then um, my last issue um, that I'd like addressed is um, I heard that you know we're doing bioswales and we've done a lot of work with the blue belt on Staten Island I have a blue belt um, project that had began begun um, at Snug Harbor, and it was—it's been stalled for years. I, I don't even know why it—you know—it stopped, it ceased. But I want to know if this is now going to be reactivated in light of the um, the devastation that you know we saw in these communities. And I just want to say that 
this storm impacted all communities. You know, um, on Staten Island, we have communities that we know traditionally flood, but there's not one community in my district that was not impacted by this storm. Thank you. Councilmember Rose, I'll, I'll address a couple of them. Um, for, for the catch basins that you'd like added, I'm happy to meet you out there, you know, whenever you'd like, and, and we, can, we can scope that out. That, that should be pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, the blue belts in, in Snug Harbor and Mid Island, there, there are more that we have on the drawing board we want to move forward with, and, you know, happy to continue to work with the, the council to get those. Is that going to be restarted? Along. Because it, 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 it was happening and then it just stopped this yeah and, and and i'll get you additional information on the on the timeline on that and the, and the funding the funding issues but we'll we'll, we'll do that um the the backwater valves backfill preventers janie you want to take that um sure council member i can uh address um some of your other points on blackwater valves so there was a program after sandy that um uh, funded installation of backwater valves in certain uh sandy affected areas we want to build on that and expand that we were actually just notified that we won a federal grant, that the city won a federal grant to um, study exactly what kinds of buildings we can install backwater valves in and kind of um, where backwater valves will work best in the city. So we're working with DEP on that and we really look forward to working with council to advance a program here. Um, I, as you mentioned, I, you know, I think installation is just one piece, but um, we're also very concerned about maintenance and we wanna make sure that, um, that we tackle that as well. Um, uh, I'm sorry, could you maybe move your mic closer? Cause I'm, I'm not really understanding some of the things you're saying. Can you hear me now? It's a little better. Um, so I, I, what I said is that we um, were recently notified that we won a federal grant to uh, study backwater valves and exactly where uh, they would be most effective. And this is really building on the program that we, um, uh, that, that, that was offered after Sandy and Sandy affected areas to install backwater valves. So we want to build and expand upon this. Um, and uh, our, in, you know, we would love to, to work with council on this as well. Um, the first step is to report back from, from the study that uh, we, we were just funded to conduct. Um, and on your points about equity, I couldn't agree more. We want to make sure that resilience investments are made in an equitable way. Um, just earlier this year, we released stormwater resiliency maps. So to your point, you know, we think about usually in the city, we think about traditional flooding as flooding in coastal areas, but this was a different kind of flooding. It was a, it was a rainstorm, it wasn't a surge event. And so it was inland areas that were also affected and the stormwater resiliency plan um, provided maps to show where we might expect um, flooding in both coastal and inland areas from, from stormwater, from intense precipitation. Um, these maps show where the risk is, where the physical risk is, but we also know we need to think about vulnerability more expansively than that, not just based on the physical risk, but also other equity factors. Um, so you may be familiar with our heat vulnerability index, which takes into account physical indicators of heat risk, but also social indicators of heat risk. We want to do the same on stormwater and make sure that, um, you know, we're taking equity into account as we make stormwater resiliency investments going forward. When were these maps, the maps you're referring to, when were these maps um, drawn up prior to the, uh, the most recent rain events, uh, water events that we've had? That's because right. If so, mm -hmm. uh, I just want to finish the point. If so, it will not reflect the, uh, the areas that were impacted in these last two events that you know, also need to be addressed. So are you going to then um, elicit our input into additional areas that, that should be looked at? Or are you going to resurvey based on the, the results of these two um, storm events? The maps were released in, in May of this year, so it was before the recent storms. Um, you know, I was previously asked about how the damage that we saw from the most recent event from the remnants of Ida actually overlapped with the, the maps and they overlapped pretty well. There was significant overlap between the extreme scenario that we mapped um, and what we saw during, um, during this most recent storm. But we're happy to talk with your office about them if you're interested and, um, and we can set up a discussion. Thank you. I will be speaking with both of you after. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Council Member. Last but not least, Council Member Koo.
Thank you, chairs, and thank you all the commissioners. Come here. Uh, you know the storm caught us by surprise, and the uh, big picture uh, solutions and small picture solutions. And you guys take care of the big picture solutions, and I'll take care of some small problems in my district. Uh, you know, folks in my district, uh, which is uh, particularly in the area in the street uh, 152nd and Pat Avenue, they have no gas for over two weeks now. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, one of you, um, I hope you can expedite the, the gas service for them because the way our client is in and building department and, and they're passing the budget each other, right? Yeah, so they need inspections and, and, and all these things, uh, red tape, so I hope you can do it as soon as possible for them. Uh, the second problem is, uh, is in the same area, Pet Avenue, the area around there used to be a pond long, long time ago, right? So it always get flooded, even though it's mowing. And the residents there complained to me uh, that because they have no street cleaning there. In the whole area, around there, four or five blocks, and then Pet Avenue and, and 56 Avenue, near the park there. There are no street cleaning and there are no alternate street parking there. So a lot of neighborhood people use their streets as parking. You know, they park their cars for there for weeks sometimes. So that the streets, the storms, the catch basins, sometimes no, since there's no street cleaning, they, they don't get clean. All the leaves fall down and my, uh, the, the, the whole system get clogged, right? So the residents there request they have street cleaning there. Not even two times a week, one time a week. So, and then alternate street parking. So the cars park there, won't park there all day long and all week long sometimes, you know? They use that place as a parking space, you know? So that's the problem. Um, the third problem is uh, during the night of the storm, fire department and policemen, they're helping people in the houses, right? For the, but nobody stopped the cars driving into the low-lying areas. So they, they, they get caught because when you're driving, you don't know how deep the water in front of you, like by Booth Memorial Avenue. It's a big pond, four feet high. But when you're driving, you so the, the, the rain, heavy rain, you cannot see too far. So from now on, please have some checkpoints and uh, tell fire department or station something, hey, don't drive. This is, no, don't drive further up. Uh, you're going <laughs> to jeopardize yourself in the water there. Even your highways, well, I see some low point, low line points. I see hundreds of cars get stopped there. So maybe you can stop there from entering the highway. Say, hey, no driving there. No, it's dangerous. And the last point I want to make is that uh, since the area, especially on the I told Pet Avenue, is a pond was a pond before it was so line. They have so much water damage. So some residents uh, suggest to me that why don't, we, why don't the city buy out these homeowners, you know? Create a park around there, use this place as a park or some soccer field so that you won't jeopardize uh, a property owner's lives. So a lot of people are willing to sell their properties. But right now, I, I, nobody wants to buy their property, right? Because the history of it. So these are the four points uh, I want you all, uh, to the care. The last thing, uh, one more thing, uh, resident compliment, the sanitation department. They said sanitation did a good job. Pick up all the garbage there. Every day they come to pick up. So the resident there uh, want me to thank all of you for doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman McCool. I have a summary question, one or two, uh, as we did a transition now to here at the MTA. Uh, from the perspective of the Office of Emergency Management and other agency with you guys here and others, uh, what are the level of communication that is going on right now between the city and the MTA? Which is the same question that I'm gonna be asking then, but I, I don't want to be asking the MTA for them to say, okay, we will refer to the city. The floating happy in the station, MTA could say, well, you know, we just get the water from the outside. So, how seriously are the conditions of the tennis station of seeing more common 
station being floating and seeing the pedestrian coming out, you know, in, really in, in danger. And especially when we had one million New Yorkers that deal with physical challenges. You know, and how are we preparing to those scenarios when people are trapped, you know, in the station? But the first one, what is going on with the water coming to the station? What is the city doing? What are you coordinating with the MTA since they are more led by the state? Are the state adding additional resources to cure those situations? And the second part is how much do you anticipate that the infrastructure plan will pass in DC, the city will get a, 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 a amount of dollars to deal of investing in infrastructure? I'll handle the first part of the question, Mr. Chair. So, um, you know, our communication with the MTA on the drainage side probably wasn't so good over the last couple of years, but when Jano came in about three months ago, the first thing he did was he reached out to us, said he wanted to reestablish the task force that we have for drainage, and our teams have been meeting since then, uh, going over a number of issues, so um, I'm, I'm happy to report that, you know, we're now having active discussions. Um, in, in some cases, though, you know, MTA is correct, and, and you're correct that Flooding on local streets, overland flooding is getting into subway entrances. Those are things that you know we're working towards seeing how we can address. Um, in other cases, it's things that MTA needs to do to tighten up, um, you know, some of the drainage in their spaces. But uh, we, we are now again having active conversations and good conversations with the MTA. that must be done, you know, city, state, federal funding in order to, you know, give a hope to the pedestrians yeah, that I don't, they would not be trapped in the stations as yeah. we are seeing those images in the last two storms. Yeah, I think the MTA could, could discuss that a little bit better, but again, I know for some of the, the street flooding that gets onto sidewalks and, and down the stairs, looking at elevating some of, uh, you know, the, the, the entrances or at least the first step um, but, but the MTA have, have discussed a lot of good things with us in the past couple of months, and I'm sure they'll present that. Okay. What, what is the evacu evacuation plan? Like, and we saw with the whole black cop that happened in the train, uh, where pedestrian was, I mean, riders, uh, correcting riders were trapped between a station, but at the end of the day, riders, they don't care about if the MTA is run by the city or the state. They just want to exit. And the MTA has some responsibility, but I assume that you guys, you know, from the NYPD, coordinated with them, Office of Emergency Manager also working. See, what is the plan? Like, how are we doing today from the exit to the street perspective to be sure that during a, a floating, during a blackout that happened in the train, a riders know where they should exit more than being trying to get a door to walk in the middle of stations. And so if I understand your question correctly, is people are now stuck on the train and what should they do, correct? Yeah, not from the perspective of inside the station, but, yeah, but in the train. how is the city doing to be sure that there's exit for people to be able to walk out? Yeah, so I'll defer to the NYPD and the FDNY to answer that question. They, they really would handle the actual evacuations, so Chief? So basically what would happen, the conductor should give a message that nobody should leave, be leaving the train. And then what happens is a rescue train comes in from either side, from the station side or from the other side, and moves up close to this train that's stuck, and the people would board the rescue train. That's what, you, that's what should happen. Back and hopefully we will, right? We defeat COVID next year, we get back, the riders go to more than five million riders a day. It, it, do you think that there's clear sign outside and inside the station about where riders have an exit plan? That more would, than waiting for the conductor to give direction? Well, we, we would also have to work with MTA on that problem. But from your end, what is it you bring to the table when you're having those conversations with the MTA about the exit plan for riders who are trapped between the stations? The, 
the, the, ride, for the, the message for the riders? Is that what you're asking? Is it the message well, for, for some, the rider or? But what are the exits? What are the emergency exits that we have? The, no, we have a nobody, nobody should leave. Someone cannot, at this moment, let's say no one can, 311 doesn't work because on, on the station because people have to provide address. What clear uh, sign does a rider have outside and inside the station or where do they have emergency exits? I don't believe there are any clear messages, especially if the train's stuck in the tunnel. If the train's stuck in the tunnel, passengers should not leave the train until emergency responders uh, remove them. Okay. They should not leave the train. That's why we have rescue trains and that's why we have emergency services units that go in and remove the people safely. Okay. I, I hope that this is something that with a new type of collaboration between the NTA, the state in the city, we can address because I feel that a station that is so busy and overcrowded, and of course we need to be planned all, always for the worst. I think that we saw with the, with the blackout that happened, it, it, that wasn't just the flooding, but flooding can also happen. Like People need to know where do they exit. And sometimes to leave it yet for the rider to try to figure out, it, beside the announcement that they can get from the conductor, I think that this is something that I hope that planning forward, we will see uh, the use of technology, another way of how riders feel that they know exactly from where they can exit, more than rely on the conductors giving direction to them. Okay. Thank you. So with that go front and center in front of you guys.
Folks, just a quick reminder, there is a hearing currently in the committee room besides us, so if you could please keep your conversations down to a minimum. We're gonna reconvene in just a moment, so if everyone could please start finding seats again, thank you. What do we got here in the cardboard here? Who's, this is from you, right? It is? Can I open it? You may. Good, right? Yeah, there you go. Look at that. Everybody got, everybody's supposed to get one. What is it? It's a bunch of posters. Oh, so I believe it is. Yeah, so I believe it is. 
I'll share, you know. Yeah, we can pass it around. Yeah, I'll know. share. Come on, especially you, you know, with your history. Yeah, man. Yeah, they're all the same. Come on, Peter. Peter, here you go. Thank you. Yeah. First we go covert, and the second thing is the homeless people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, well. People get scared by them, you know. They don't want to get hurt. So we have to get the homeless people off to the suburbs. Uh, I, I mean, it, it's 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 a whole. Fine. Uh, it's a whole thing, man. It's a whole thing. I mean, at least get them most of the hours. Stop right. Find a place to live. Well, because I'm bouncing around today, I, I came in with my electric car, so yeah. I, people. Ah, I'm yeah. gonna, I'm, that's that's, that's going to be my retirement. Electric cars, you need. You, that's going to be my retirement. Plan. It don't pay not to get it because I was I, I was looking at a because I've always had Rav fours as a, a Toyota, so I looked at the hybrid. The hybrid is like a ton of money, and they said, well, you got a plug-in hybrid, right? They said, yeah, if you get the plug-in. You get seven thousand five hundred dollar tax credit in your next year, and the state will give you thousand dollars. So it's like eight thousand five hundred. But, but off depends the on the model of the car. Right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, well, the thing is, that with the, in order to get the um, in order to get the federal tax credit and the thing for the state, it's got to be a plug-in that can go like at least like forty miles. And so my my Rav Four can do, you know, forty two miles running on just batteries. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and, and the pipe, well, when the thing is like, yeah. if you go on a long trip and the battery dies out, it just becomes a regular hybrid, which yeah. is still good, yeah. you know, so I never buy gas anymore. I don't drive more than 42 miles a day. You yeah. know, yeah. Going. Most people do. <laughs> yeah, I ain't plugging it in. So as we continue this important hearing that started with representations of the administration. It, it, what we heard, what we heard, how prepared was the city to deal with this flooding and where they feel that they could do better. Now we move into here from the MTA, as everyone know, is the largest transportation system in the whole nation. It's a corporation that has a value of $1 trillion. It's so important, not only for the resident, but also for the visitor and for the whole Northeast. Uh, as, as we express to the other uh, members of the panels, uh, we know that the men and women in any other institution, including the MTA, wake up, go to sleep, thinking to do the best to serve the riders. But uh, we just want to be sure that uh, today, as we were here from the MTA, on what did they learn from those experience. When we ask any question, it's not a personal question, it's about how can we be better prepared. Uh, to deal with all the natural disaster as those that we have uh, in the previous superstone or anyone that come in the future. So with that, I will now have our committee council call on the administration to testify and administer the oath. Uh, okay, I'll now call from the MTA, uh, Senior Vice President of Subways, New York City Transit, uh, Demetrius Critchlow. Uh, Chief Engineer for MTA Construction and Development, Matt Best, and Director of MTA Construction and Development, Stephen Lair. Uh, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You may begin your testimony when ready. Hello, and thank you for having us today. My name is Demetrius Critchlow. I'm the Senior Vice President for the Department of Subways at New York City Transit. I'm joined here today by Matt Best, the Chief Engineer for MTA Construction and Development, 
and Stephen Lohr, Recovery and Resiliency D Director within uh, CND as well. Before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, Speaker Johnson, who's not here today, um, Chairs Rodriguez, Gennaro, Gennaro Brent Brannon, for the invitation and for their continued advocacy on behalf of our system and all New Yorkers. We're here today to talk about Hurricane Ida, how New York City Transit prepared for it, how it affected our customers and infrastructure, and what we're doing to make the system resilient again against future storms, which, make no mistake, lie ahead due to the ongoing threat of global warming and climate change. Mass transit is itself an antidote to climate change. It should be emphasized at the onset that our mass transit services allow New Yorkers to combat climate change each and every day by simply foregoing a longer congested commute in personal vehicles, helping us all to lead more carbon efficient lives. It also allows the city to have extremely dense pot development, one key to economic success, which also allows us to have one of the lowest rates of greenhouse gas emissions per capita in the nation. On September 1st, the subway system was challenged by a historic weather emergency that impacted not just mass transit, but the entire city and region. The storm dropped a record three and a half inches of rain in just one hour. The resulting flash floods overwhelmed the city's storm sewer systems, flooding streets and roads and train tracks, not just across the city, but the region. Naturally, they also flooded many areas in the subways, which led to a disruption of service on almost all lines. Out of the roughly 350 subway, station, subway trains that were operating at the peak of the storm, less than 20 got stranded outside of the stations. Transit supervisors and managers, including many off-duty personnel who answered the call that evening, evacuated around 1,000 passengers with the assistance of the FDNY and NYPD. Many more, of course, were delayed and or had to use alternate routes. Fortunately, no one was injured and the overwhelming majority of our customers made it home safely. I wanna take a moment to thank our incredible transit frontline employees for the historic heroic efforts in keeping people safe and making sure the system was safe to restart. In addition to the personnel in the field, our employees were corresponding with customers every step of the way, by phone, email, social media. Our partners in buses also came through in a major way. We had been planning for this storm for two days before it hit. Understanding the potential for flash flooding, we pre-deployed pumps pump trains, and engineering maintenance crews across the system, and installed flood mitigation barriers at many locations known for historical flooding from heavy rain to mitigate effects. Because of these preparations, New York City Transit was able to run sustained bus service throughout the storm and rapidly recover subway service. Within three hours of the end of the storm, New York City Transit developed the majority, delivered the majority of subway service in addition to continuous full bus service. Within 32 hours, service was restored on all lines except the segment of the six in the Bronx. This took a Herculean effort. Our crews worked around the clock to pump out 75 million gallons of water from the system. All that water has to go somewhere. You've heard General Lieber say the subway system is not a submarine. It cannot be made impervious to water. It's also not a sponge. We can't absorb water either. Neither, as you've heard, can the sewer system, which was overwhelmed by the intense rainfall. This isn't a new issue. Weeks before, Henri and Ida upon being named acting chair and CEO, 
Jano made dealing with non-coastal flooding of our systems a top priority and reactivated our special task force on flash flooding with city partners at DEP, OEM, and DOT. The, the task force will be determining ways to improve our emergency response coordination. The group will also help identify subway stations most vulnerable to flooding and develop joint strategies for flash flood mitigation investments. The focus will be on keeping stormwaters out of our system through improved drainage along the streets and in sewers, and where necessary in storing, uh, installing water interdiction infrastructure to target locations to protect the subway. We recognize that this is an incredibly challenging issue that will only continue to grow in importance, and we look forward to collaborating with the city and all of you to deliver a more resilient subway for New Yorkers. But to make it clear, we have been aggressively doing our part to improve our system's resiliency in low-lying areas, especially over the last decade. Since Superstorm Sandy, we've invested over $2.5 billion to protect the subway system against flooding from major coastal storms. We've installed flood protection measures at over 3,500 vulnerable subway openings, at 33 stations, stairways, vents, elevator shafts, emergency exits, hatches, and manholes. As we rebuilt our Under River tubes, after Sandy, we've upgraded emergency pumps, elevated critical equipment, and installed redundant cabling to ensure key systems remain operational in the event of flooding. And we're in the midst of constructing massive flood walls around three of our most critical subway yards, as well as St. George Terminal in Staten Island. However, it is important to understand that coastal flooding and flash flooding present two very different challenges and require different strategies. Coastal storms like Sandy push massive amounts of corrosive salt water over land. These storms are generally slow moving, forecast well in advance, and impact defined coastal areas. Thus, we can target our coastal storm investments to these known vulnerable locations, and we can prepare and deploy to these areas in a predictable manner, days in advance of an approaching storm. Flash floods like Ida, on the other hand, are very fast moving, less predictable, and can affect any part of the subway system at any time. And while Ida had impacts all across the city, flash flood impacts are typically more localized. And as we've seen in many previous storms, it only takes a single clogged drain or blocked vent at street level to send stormwater cascading into the subway system. While fresh water from heavy rains is far less devastating to our equipment and infrastructure than salt water, it does have the potential to affect subway service and to pose safety risks for our customers and employees. And we take this concern very seriously. Following major flash flooding in 2007, the MTA worked collaboratively with New York City DOT and DEP, invested over 60 million and flash flood mitigation measures at 25 subway stations that had a history of flooding during heavy rainstorms. These improvements included sealing vents, installing raised vent gratings, adding a top landing at station stairways, regrading sidewalks, and adding check valves at subway drains. Prior to Ida's historic rainfall, these efforts had proven to be quite successful with significantly fewer annual train delays due to heavy rain since 2008. More recently, the subway action plan included a system-wide expansion of drain repairs and vent cleaning to maximize the efficiency of our pumping system. But while our network of pumps is robust and extensive, 786 pumps and remove 14 million gallons of water on a dry day, they are primarily designed to pump away groundwater and are not designed to be a substitute for the city's sewer system, 
which they pump directly into. Therefore, they require sufficient sewer capacity in order to be effective. And as we experienced on Ida, the city sewer system is simply not equipped to handle such massive volumes of stormwater. We have made billions of dollars of investments in our system and the results of, and the results of the subway action plan and other efforts by New York City Transit. Heroic workforce have led to much improved on-time performance, but we must continue to adapt to the reality of the impacts of climate change. We are encouraged by the collaborative response from many of the city agencies that were testifying before us today, and we stand ready to partner with them and the City Council to increase our system's resiliency, to, serve, to best serve our constituents, your constituents, and our customers. With that, we're happy to take your questions. Thank you. I have a few questions and my colleagues also, uh, the chairs and my uh, colleague, Councilmember Ku and, uh, uh, and the others who come, to, uh, following others who come, they will also have questions. When you talk about the task force, uh, which is important to have, when will the task force schedule to submit their first report? So they've had meetings already, even as early as yesterday, we're out in the field viewing locations. Um, they've targeted specific locations where the flooding happened during Ida, um, taking a look at the local landscape to determine what challenges exist there. Um, I look forward to hearing their results when we, uh, we get But do, do they have a schedule when they will present a full, a full report of their recommendations? So I think, I think it's larger than just, if, if they were to give me a full report tomorrow, I would not be happy with the results. I think this problem is a lot larger than something that can be solved in the short term and it requires a real investment of time and effort into determining what the challenges are. But they don't have, as we, they were created, there was no giving a timeline. Let's say we have created a yellow tax report and say that report must be ready in three months, two months. What is the time frame of that report? I can follow up and, and get a time for you, but okay. I don't have one. Okay, and, and what are the assignments of that? What is the assignment of that task force? What are the specific a, a area that we want for them to focus on? So there's a couple of things, right? So first, you determine what locations actually flooded or got rain. And then you look at the areas around that area, um, the street locations, um, the sewer areas, um, and you take, a, take an assessment as to what the challenges are that cause the flooding to enter our system. Um, I'll turn it over to Matt Best, who is our engineering expert and he could talk a little bit about the specifics. Yeah, so it, it, to, to, we, we, our first meeting was actually on August 6th, so well before Henri or Ida. We recognize, that as, as, was, uh, as, as Commissioner Sapienoza stated, uh, when Jano took over, this was a top priority, and it was, it was immediately uh, identified as something that we want to address immediately. So we convened a meeting uh, within, within days to begin addressing the, the issues. And we see it as a task force that where we're going to jointly approach these problems. We obviously are focused on keeping water, stormwater out of our subway system. That's our primary goal. Um, as, as Demetrius said, our, our system is not to be a substitute for the storm sewer. We primarily are concerned about keeping it dry from groundwater, but with that, we need to work with the city to make sure that their system is designed in a way that keeps the water out. So we are working collaboratively with them to identify the locations where systemically there have been issues. This was done back in 2007, where a number of locations were identified across the city. Probably the largest concentration was in Queens Boulevard, along the Queens Boulevard line, where it was identified that sewer capacity issues were going to lead to overtopping of the curbs periodically. So we worked with the city to design interdictions to protect our vents, to make the, st the stairways be a little bit higher, just to keep the stormwater out of our system and prevent the flooding from occurring. 
And that's what this task force will do again. We'll continue to look at locations that have been experiencing these conditions uh, historically. And we'll also, we're, we're sharing all the data that we've collected, all the data they're collecting, where the trouble spots are, and we're gonna focus on those areas, and then can just continue to work out. Um, as we, we've had in this summer, we've had flooding in locations where we've never had flooding before. So either it's just random chance, or it's something has changed. So this group will continue to meet, probably in perpetuity, so that we can address these things as conditions change. Have you identified the problem that you guys, I mean, you mean the institution, the corporation, and, and the system deal with, with so much water getting into the stations, and even though, you know, as we already know that our generation is the one that had to be dealing with a lot of natural disaster, something that didn't happen probably 50 years ago. But now we cannot say that this is the last one. Sunday was one, there's no storm, now with Ida, tomorrow can be something else. Reality that there's a lot of water that move under the stations, like, like when you look at 157, one train, like, or if you look at knowing this past flooding by the past, the Dibanet train have been getting a lot of water. And that water is not necessarily coming from the outside. Is that the water that is moving from the inside station. So what are the challenges that you see right now when it comes to, you know, a station being flooded, uh, dealing with the flooding of water? So I'll say New York City Transit is accustomed to dealing with water. Um, as I mentioned, on, a, a, on any given day, we pump out around 14 million, dollar, uh, 14 million gallons of water a day. So we're accustomed to dealing with water. We make sure that we maintain. And, and where are those water coming from? From underground? Yes. Is, is that what happened? Yes. The water is too close to the station. Is that what happened? We're at the low level of the city. Low level? Right. So. Um, so we make sure that the drains that the water goes into are cleared. We um, have uh, pumps located throughout the system that continually uh, are maintained. Um, we have a process for which for triage in uh, specific locations. Um, we have uh, maintenance schedules based upon the amount of water that a, a location will receive. Um, and again, on any given day, this is handled without any impact to the customer. They don't see this. This happens seamlessly. Uh, it, this is just a unique circumstance. But that's a, that the circumstances that we now we have to be planning for now on, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's the norm of our life. Like that's what you know. I this week the weather have been very nice, right? Mm -hmm. But for me, like the message that the winter will be tough, because for me the winter that the weather that we get in, in September is like the weather that in a traditional year, it has been like August. Like the 80 degrees usually is like the August weather. So for me, it's about we need to be ready also. Let's enjoy this day, but let's also take it as a signal that the winter will be tough. It could be that it doesn't happen, but in, you know, without having the, that background expertise, that's what the average New Yorker we will see. So, so you know, like that, that's our challenge, and in, in, in especially for those of you in the leadership position. It, what are what are the when you look at the past flooding? Do you think that at some point the MTA should shut down the station as soon as they knew that the is this something? Not necessarily. I'm not saying that that the state the, we failed because we didn't do it. Probably we can learn from this. Do you anticipate that one of the initiatives probably to be put on the table is that when there's a the weather prediction is that we're going to be getting these numbers of inches of water, that at some point we had to probably get used to say, you know, we'll be shutting down sun stations in order to prevent, you know, for riders to be in situation as we saw in so many images. So you make an excellent point. One of the challenges that we face in every day uh, tackling of incidents or issues is we move millions of people to work 
to the city around the uh, infrastructure in order to get to some place. Um, once we've done that, once we've moved them to that location, we have a commitment and obligation to return them to their homes. This specific issue, this specific incident, had we handled it differently and determined that we would shut down, we would have stranded those folks who we brought into the city to get to work. The challenge is really in the forecast, having good information up front. Um, and I think it's clear, there's no question that at the beginning, there was no effort to shut down the city. There was no call that um, we would, that, that this storm was coming that would require no one to go to work. So we have an obligation to bring those folks to work. The question is really about when do you shut down? And for an event like a Sandy, where we can forecast in advance what we're going to get, when we're going to get it, and how we're going to get it, we do plan to shut down the system. We have a, a very, very strict plan on how to do it. Flooding, especially as we talked about the, uh, for this type of flash flooding, could happen at any location. So if you have flash flooding in the Bronx, while we take select we do, at certain lines, we will restrict service, we will stop service on those lines, we will cl close off the stations to those lines. We don't shut down the entire system because we don't want to impact the entire, entirety of our ridership based upon flash flooding in one location. So it's really based upon where we receive the report and the information that we have at hand. Okay. Do, do you think that... Only 70 percent of the station they had camera before, but the announcement yesterday that now all of them have, a, from now on, they will have camera. Will those technology, the camera use at the station, do you think that they also can be used for you to have a better system to look at the situation that is going on in station so that, you know, that we avoid as much as possible? Mm -hmm to see some even senior citizens, people with physical challenges, you know, trying to come out from the station, you know, like, how do you think that with the whole new plan that now every single station, based on what you said yesterday, came out in the media yesterday, now they will have camera. It will also help for you to monitor the situation when there's a potential raining coming out. So the cameras are great for reviewing something after the fact. Unless you have a team of people that are there watching these thousands of cameras um, at the very time while this is going on, you really don't have the ability to do that. Um, the cameras uh, don't monitor all locations within a station. Um, so I think the best information that we could have is based upon the, the eyes and ears that we have on, on our property our conductors, our train operators, our engineers, our station agents, our maintenance crews that, that we, we strategically place throughout the system um, who are there to respond. Um, so I think that's the, the best way that we yeah. uh, monitor. I, I, I just hope that, you know, as you have a task force and, and all of us are open to look at innovation, innovating idea, that, you know, and have, of course, like if you think about one location to monitor all the camera on location, mm -hmm. it's different by a few divided per borough, uh, per area. I think that, you know, and, and, and camera is important only to send the message to the rider that they should feel safe with the crime that is affecting our stations, but also that, you know, when any situation happens in the station, that they know that there's someone looking at that, what's going on, from the black cloud that happened to, you know, this situation. So, you know, I hope that, as, again, as you continue having the task force working and you and the rest of the leadership of the MTA to really look at that technology as something to monitor. But I think that riders want to feel that they've been watched when they're in the station. So your point is duly noted. And uh, Matt here is on the task force, so he'll make sure to take it back to the team. Um, should not be just used after. I think that it should be working 24-7. And, and I feel that if you talk to the tech community, 
and of course you guys work with all of them, most of them in the private sector, I think that it's important to see what are the capacity of those cameras, how much more can they do. My last question before my colleague has question is about the emergency exit plan. Uh, I feel that up to now, when we look at the emergency exit plan, we've been happy to send the message that no one should get out of the train unless they get direction from conductor, the conductor. When we saw the blackout and right at some point they're desperate and they get out of the train and they try to get an exit to go out to a new station or to the street, uh, it could be, again, for a human error that happened with the blackout, but it can happen because of the natural disaster. How do you feel is the exit plan, the exit signal in the station for people to know where they should exit, more beside waiting for direction? And I know I'm not, I'm not pretending that in a system that there's a lot of powerful ener ener energy, electricity, we are expecting that people should be walking out knowing that there's a powerful cable there. But my concern is that I don't think that there's right now a plan, a emergency exit plan in our stations. And I'm thinking about from the inside of yes, you guys coordinating the NYPD, but also from the outside exit at the street level for people to know this is the exit that if someone is in the station because of flooding, because of natural disaster, of any other type of disaster, people should know exactly where to exit beside waiting for the conductor to give them direction. So um, I certainly understand your concern. Uh, and each circumstance, each scenario is different. How you handle it is, is different. Our primary objective is to make sure to keep customers safe and knowing firsthand the inherent dangers of having customers on the tracks. Without our guidance, I can't offer any other solution other than to remain on the train where it's safe. A plan that, that, that advocates for customers making their own determination as to what is safe and exiting a train um, will ultimately lead to something that is unsafe. There's no question. Um, and again, in these scenarios, we have a very, very strict code of protocol on how to deal with crews, what the emergency response should be, our relationship with the police and FDNY, we have them in our control center. That, that relationship is seamless. What's not seamless is when customers take their own safety into their hand. We have no control of their safety when they're, when they're taken into their own hands. So we, we, we ask that customers, under all circumstances, wait for our direction before taking their own safety into their own hands in a system that they just don't know. Okay. Now let's go to the council member. Councilman Miller. Thank you, Chair. So um, I, I appreciate uh, MTA and you, 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 uh, Vice President, you and your team being here and uh, information that you have given to the committee. Um, I have a, a, a couple of questions. And um, one, I'd be remiss if I really didn't talk about the workforce and its preparedness um, to be able to evacuate and, and really service um, transition um, their, their line of service to to the public. Um, what does that what does that look like? Um, has it evolved since my many years on that side? And and what 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 kind of training can we expect? And 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 how has that how did that trans transition into? Um, removing folks from trains and buses around the city first. 
So um, in terms of our folks, uh, there's no question New York City Transit employees, MTA plant employees at large are a fantastic workforce. Um, the work that they get done on a daily basis when under normal circumstances is just amazing. Uh, but when circumstances like this arise, they have the ability, the desire, the dedication to go above and beyond under all circumstances to get the job done. But it is our responsibility to train them to do that. So um, it's interesting because right now we're, in, we're undertaking this, this huge um, infusion of new employees in. And one of the things that we talk about in training is the very evacuation of customers, um, what, what the communication should be. Um, we, have a, we have a simulation of a train in distress with no lights, a smoke condition within a tunnel. We take the cust our, our employees through that. Um, we let them simulate that in real life. So we understand the value of training our employees. We're always looking for opportunities to do better. Um, but your point is well taken. We have, to, we have to have a training program and we have to invest in our employees so that they can be what they need to be when those circumstances arise. I, I, that, that I can appreciate, and um, and 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 so um, part of that is the coordination and the support from whether it's management and supporting agents of uh, surrounding agencies and allow them to to do so because it is very difficult from some uh, from a conductor, motorman, or a bus operator to kind of transition from driving to now instruction folks to to get out and whether or not the the riding public is willing to receive those instructions. I think that. Part of the problem of what we've seen in this particular instance there is some of those situations there, but particular instructions around dealing with distressed public, you know, um, I, I would, if, if it doesn't occur, and I know that it does, that, that we, we would kind of step that up. And then, and then secondly, you know, I'd like to ask um, how, how and this is generally whether whether it's upstairs or down in, in trains or buses, but uh, there's been a lot of focus on 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 uh, the subway system, and I'd like to talk about surface a little bit. And how do we how do you aggregate and compile data based on service disruption, and then ultimately use that data to to mitigate and prevent future uh, disruptions in in service? And I, I say that. Um, I, I looked at some of the bus lines that have been disrupted, and they are no different from the bus lines that were disrupted 10, 15 years ago when it was part of my task to, to, to manage that. And, and, and so um, do, do, is there a coordination in, in DOT and in, in, in DOT and agency coordination that, you know, this we consistently uh, are forbidden from going down a particular roadway that road is a problem. Um, you know, what, what are you guys doing? What can we do differently? Can you speak to those conversations, those interagency conversations? Sure thing. So uh, to your first point um, about making sure that our folks on the trains have uh, the ability to be able to communicate with uh, our customers when they are evacuating them, it is certainly a, a um, an amazing undertaking, particularly when you're under strain. So this, this last uh, event, what we did was, when we first identified that there were trains uh, stranded, um, we immediately dispatched supervisors and managers to those trains, immediately. Um, we didn't have any idea of how long the outage would be, but our immediate position was to send people to those trains. Um, that f facilitates a communication level um, where a, a conductor may not necessarily feel comfortable dealing directly with the fire department and discharging them. We would love for them, we give them the tools to do that, but when you're first doing that, you may not necessarily feel the most comfortable doing it. So we dispatch supervisors and managers to assist with that process, to help shepherd them through that. Um, and they did, again, you know, uh, approximately a thousand customers were evacuated without issue. So, um, that just speaks to the amazing efforts that were put forward by uh, the police department, FDNY, 
the uh, supervisors and managers, many of which who came from their own homes um, on, on, their own, on their own time to pitch in. Um, again, so that effort is just, it, it, it's hard to find words to just tell the level of commitment that these folks have for the job. And the second point you spoke about is, is, is how do we do better with communicating um, uh, to our city partners, uh, DEP, what's that coordination like? And um, so, so it does happen diff within the different districts, the different boroughs of the, at the depots. Um, but I do think that, this, that this, this new group that we're setting up, the task force, will have a better impact on that. I think that when you loop in the larger agencies and have them all involved in discussions, you, with that information becomes power. Um, I'll let Matt uh, comment a little more on that. Yeah, as, uh, as we continue to work, we're, we're, we're taking multi-prong approach to this task force. And one of them is specifically on the side of operations and how do we receive the information um, how do we use, how do we deploy the information before an event and then how do we communicate during an event? And we have a, a very tight connection between our operations center and when we, we activate emergency response, a lot of direct communication with the city and, and how they respond. I know that DEP will specifically deploy resources to trouble spots. We do the same thing. We're, and and as, we, as we bring data together and discuss it, we'll find perhaps more efficient ways to do that so that we can multiply our own efforts as we respond to these from, a, from an operational standpoint. So it's, just, it's really about getting the information to the right people's hands at the right times in order for that to be actionable and just, just to make the results better. So Matt, Matt t commented on an amazing point. That information is critical. So within New York City Transit, I have the areas that are important to me what areas I know flood for me. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that DOT has the same concerns. Their areas at street level, may be, they may be completely flooded at street level, and we just haven't seen it in the subway system yet. That, still, that issue still needs to be tackled. So the task force is going to take all of that information. Again, that information is, is, is a critical piece in having, having, good, having a good plan to go forward. So taking that information and, and from different various stakeholders is, to me, is what's going to make a really concrete plan for response. So, so currently, command center, they, they get a call from, from a bus operator on the road and, and, and that this street is blocked. There's coordination with, with agencies at that point there, right? That whether it's FDNY, police department, D, DDP, and, and others, that, that not only are you dispatching, they perhaps a supervisor dispatcher to the scene, but the appropriate agencies are also being notified that, that is that currently happen now, happening now? Yes, yes. So that in, in the incident, all of the, no, they, they work hand in hand during an incident. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought we were talking about how do we fix this going forward? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But, but, right. but at the same time, we are, you know, in the moment, we, we, we're, we're coordinating with other folks. And, yes. and, and I was certainly saying, how do we take a look at the information? Because, you know, oftentimes it's the same stations, it's the same routes that, that are being impacted. And, and so, you know, customers over the years are saying like, you know, why, wh why me? Why is it that ENF and folks from Jamaica, you know, can't get back home and, and or certain uh, bus routes, why can't we, you know, um, and if, if it continues to happen, you know, it should be enough information that is gathered in order for us to, for the future, to be able to address it. And then finally, you know, we've all seen this fine poster that you have here. I want to talk about, allow you to speak on how you guys have really dived into it and, and what that really means. And, and, and if in fact, for, for me and, and the greater Jamaica area, um, what difference in the future of, of, of um, sustainability will a, uh, a fully electric bus depot and, and, and bus fleet have on the environment and mitigating some of these things that we see in the future? So I think New York City Transit, again, as we talked about it, is, is a key element to success and, and the sustainability of our environment. Um, 
without mass transportation, New York City or any of the boroughs, uh, areas that surround it just don't survive. We, we, don't, we don't thrive. So um, su successful transportation, um, our stakeholders, uh, community leaders, uh, government officials, we all should be committed to sustainability of our environment. And New York City Transit, the MTA as a whole, is a huge, huge part of that. Um, so we're always looking for opportunities to do things brighter, faster, smarter. Um, you know, I'll tell you that Craig, as the uh, acting uh, interim president for New York City Transit, has been a huge proponent of, of doing things on the bus side firsthand that have been um, groundbreaking in terms of where we used to be on our buses and where we're going. Um, so we're definitely, um, definitely uh, supportive of that. Um, do you want to uh, add anything? No, not on the bus depot, I was just going to jump in on your data sharing point okay. before and just, you know, talking about getting ahead of this problem a little bit more. We have worked with the city in the past looking at historic trouble spots, right? But as Matt said, the floods from Ida affected places we've never seen flood before. And I think we're really excited about the modeling the city has done and shared with us for future flooding under different sea level rise scenarios, under greater storms so that we can expand that list of stations that we're addressing, right? And the, the locations where we have worked previously to mitigate flash flooding with physical improvements, we've seen uh, you know, big improvements in, in delay reductions from that. So I think the, you know, the next step for us is getting ahead of the problem instead of just being reactive to historic trouble spots. And that's what, you know, one of the exciting parts of the task force. And thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Now let's <clears throat> let's call okay, Councilman Holden, who has a few questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I know it's a huge challenge, and uh, when you see storms like Ida, but um, on the 25 stations that you did work on, uh, mitigate flood mitigation, and there's 33 others that you uh, worked on. Did 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 the improvements hold? Did did it work? Did, did the mitigation, flood mitigation systems work, like check valves and so forth? So we're, we'd love to tell that story. Right. Yeah, sure. So <laughs> thank you for your enthusiasm for my <laughs> response. Um, so a couple points there, I guess. So the, the 33 that uh, we mentioned earlier that are coastal flood stations, right, those really were not places where we saw a correlation with flooding during Ida, and we usually don't during heavy rains, right? It's the areas near the coast usually drain better to the rivers or the harbor. And it's these inland stations and valleys, um, you know, or steeper topography areas that, uh, that are the problem in those heavy rainstorms. So for those, and this is places like Hillside Avenue in Jamaica, um, Upper Manhattan, there's some spots, uh, 138th Street in the Bronx. Those areas, yeah, they did relatively well compared to the rest of the city. Um, there, as we mentioned, you know, the places that have flooded in previous lesser rainstorms than Ida, so we were, you know, somewhat expecting that those areas were spots to address. Um, they, the primary objective of those, right, in the initial, uh, that initial program from like 10 years ago was minimizing impacts on subway service. That's, we've, we've seen those deliver in the decades since. I think the next wave is making sure that there's basic, you know, Water on the streets will become water in the station. So to the, ex to the extent that those investments can be helpful in recurring spots, that's great. But if it's, you know, there, we have tens of thousands of openings to the subway system, it's completely, you know, infeasible to install those at every one of them. And so the mission for us working with the city will be keep, waters, keep water on the streets, keep water in the sewers, not down the staircases, not through the vents. So, so we're, we're, we're doing better, we're doing better, but you know, there's other things involved. I mean, you mentioned Queens Boulevard flooding, because that hits home, it's, it's next to my district. And uh, were there any other, I mean, we've, we saw a video of people wading through four feet of water and, and um, water coming up from underneath. Um, obviously those stations, have you, and, and I know the task force will identify the worst stations, but does one come in, in, in mind that it's a huge problem like Queens Boulevard? Because Queens Boulevard is historically, that area is flooded. Um, and I'm going back 15, 20 years when we had storms. 
uh, that area was flooded. And so nothing's changed. Do we have those chronic locations that we worry about to the point where maybe we should warn people not to go in with some kind of warning light? We have technology that can warn people, you know, you can do it in an instant, warn people on Queens Boulevard, don't go down to the subway. You know, the light, red light comes on. So, so interestingly, we do have locations that we, uh, we consider to be more likely to have some type of water condition, um, and we prepare for those, those locations. So we will send folks to those locations. We will have pumps prepared at those locations. Uh, we will um, cover the events at those locations. We, we take a lot of steps to ensure that those locations don't have any issues. And uh, to your point, those are the locations that we generally don't have the issues with. But I think that what, what one of Jano's, Jano Leba's key uh, elements in setting up this task force is it's critical to identify system-wide where we stand. Um, and again, this was before, this was before um, uh, Ida. Um, we want to make sure that we have the best plan system-wide that addresses this. Okay, just one other question, just a point possibly. Um, the, was there any, uh, was there a, uh, an effort to clean the tracks prior to the storm? Uh, because we've always seen, we see debris on the tracks and I, I have to think that some of that might have been the reason for the excessive uh, flooding some of the debris on the tracks. Was, that, was there an effort to clean? So we have, we have huge efforts for drain cleaning, both in our stations and on our tracks. Um, we have some locations that are, that are um, drain, uh, cleaned from monthly, some locations up to three years. Um, our, our, because of Sandy, I'm sorry, but because of the funding we got for um, Subway action plan? Subway action plan, sorry, thank you. The subway action plan we got, um, we, we, we spend a, a ton of efforts in making sure that those drains are cleaned, again, even when there's no storm coming. But remember, we had Henri that was not too, not too uh, that was just before. I know, but my, my, my question is about Ida. Was there a specific cleaning effort in yes. the days prior? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I'd like to thank you, the will for working with us with this and many other issues and, and you guys hopefully there's a new day with the MTA where it's not so controlled by the governor because I think that when Biden left MTA in New York City Transit it was a big loss it, and I hope that again that we get into the new environment where you know the MTA should be treated and seen as even though most of the members and chairman are appointed by the governor but should have the level of independence to continue working with these ideas and be able to work with the city of York, especially with the DOT and all the agency. Uh, before, so thank you for your participation. Before calling the members of the public, we have a few of them. I want to say in Spanish que hoy, and recognizing Council Member Levin, eh, queremos decir en español que nosotros hoy estamos llegando al final de la audiencia, donde estuvimos escuchando cómo en el, en el día de lo, en el flooring de Ida, Aida, nosotros miramos que tanto la Ciudad de Nueva York como la MTA tuvo un plan, pero nosotros creemos de que todavía pudo hacer mejor y esperamos también de que lo que pasó, eh, especialmente con las personas que murieron, las condiciones que se dieron en las estaciones de trenes, sean algo que nosotros podamos aprender para que el sistema de transportación de la Ciudad de Nueva York continúe siendo no solamente el más grande de la nación, sino también el más seguro, y que la ciudad de Nueva York con sus agencias trabajen más coordinada para prepararnos mejor para desastres naturales como el que tuvimos anteriormente. With that, thank you to the members of this panel. Now we're going to be calling uh, members of the, of the public, and we will have in the clock in two minutes. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I just want to point out that uh, one more member of the Environmental Committee of my committee is joining us, uh, Council Member Steve Levin.
Okay, uh, next we'll hear from members of the public. Um, we have Lisa Daglian, um, Adam Roberts, Haley Gorenberg, and Tyler Taba. Uh, and if there are any other members of the public that are here at this time to testify, if you could uh, come up to the uh, panel here. Feel free. If you feel that your testimony is longer than two minutes, you summarize so that we can keep into. Lisa, would you like to go first? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Lisa Dagley, and I'm the Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA, or PCAC. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Uh, we've heard a lot today about how these last few weeks have been a wake-up call for all of us, and how more must be done to protect the transit system that is the lifeblood of our region from the ravages of Mother Nature. The storms, Henri, Ida, and whatever comes next, are a clear indication that new solutions must be found. The fact that service was restored as quickly as it was is a testament to the hard work of everyone at the MTA. Riders counted on them and they delivered, and we thank them for everything they did. We also thank the first responders and city and state agencies and utilities that responded quickly and in force to get the region back on the move. But the storms highlighted the fragile ecosystem in which we live. Subways are not submarines, but people ride in a hole in the ground, and that's the level that water seeks. We heard earlier that the MTA pumped 75 million gallons of water out of the subways after Ida, and that's staggering. It's a miracle that no one lost their life in the subway system. It's critical that the MTA, city, and state accelerate their lessons learned reviews which we've heard are already underway, and we know are underway at the MTA, and take a hard look at third-party causes of water infiltration, such as the manhole that seemingly caused the 28th Street gusher. It's essential that immediate steps be taken to harden infrastructure like street drains, subway pumps, and sewers, all of the systems that we need to rely on to handle a deluge like we saw most recently during Ida, but that we can expect with increasing regularity. The MTA and the city must also look to their capital programs in the context of resiliency and reprioritize their projects as necessary. Chair Rodriguez, earlier you, you um, talked about the 207th Street and Coney Island yards, um, and these are certainly included in, in re-looking at, at, at their prioritizations. The task force that we heard more earlier about um, must also look at the joint priority projects and how to move them forward expeditiously. This will all take money. That's why it's so critical that funding come to the MTA from federal, state, and local sources, including the city's commitment to the MTA's 2024 capital program, and highlights more than ever the importance of central business district tolling, otherwise known as congestion pricing. We'll be speaking in support of that at upcoming public meetings and urge you to support it and do so as well. Thank you. Could you uh, say your name, please? Sure. Um, my name is Haley Gorenberg, and I am the legal director of New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. We're a community-driven civil rights organization with an environmental justice program. We must use this moment to address inadequate infrastructure and transform New York City's environmental justice communities so that they are resilient and thriving as part of a citywide initiative to better prepare for more powerful storms like Hurricane Ida and other challenges wrought by global warming. Much of what we need to do is work right under our feet on the city's sewer system. When storms slam into the city and dump rain and runoff, the fitness of our sewers determines our well-being. Are they flooding and collapsing? If so, our infrastructure failings contaminate homes and waterways, destroy possessions and lives, and even potentially drown fellow New Yorkers, especially in poor communities and communities of color. Since the Thanksgiving 2019 sewage backup disaster that wrecked homes and lives for hundreds of New Yorkers in South Ozone Park's Queens, NILPI has convened 
and been working with a half dozen excellent New York law firms working pro bono as part of NLP's South Ozone Park Sewage Legal Assistance Project, or SLAP, to pursue justice for families flooded out by sewage. When Ida hit the city, the storm hit our team and community partners with a sense of dreadful familiarity. Ida's rain synergized with decrepit and inadequate sewer infrastructure to cause disastrous flood damage and even death. The record dropped by the previous Queen sewer disasters caused by infrastructure malfunction for which the city appropriately took responsibility, responsibility provides a case in point. With or without storms, the state of the city's sewers has become life-threatening. These are examples from one of the city's numerous environmental justice communities fighting marginalization on any number of fronts, including horrendous impacts of dilapidated infrastructure, especially when it's stressed by more and more frequent and violent storms. Again and again, climate disasters will hit these communities first and worst, but if our government addresses their needs, the city will be uplifted and everyone will be safer. Okay, I'm going to um, skip to some points about what we learned from the city's claims process, which is also part of the agency infrastructure that the cities lack and that families need to be resilient in the face of disaster. And that's why we created our project. Because I think that these problems that Queens residents experience provide a roadmap to improve service. So quickly, some examples. The city helped with cleanup in some instances, but it didn't ensure that sewage damaged belongings were cataloged or photographed or otherwise recorded before they were hauled away. So when residents sought to get compensated for the damage, they lacked what would have been simple records to support their claims. Replacement boilers installed by the city led to complaints of substandard installation and lack of necessary insulating barriers and residents had trouble procuring what they were told should have been simple tracking documentation from agencies showing exactly what was installed. Overall, proofs of loss were poorly understood and inappropriate downward pressure on losses resulted. Here's just one example. People with low limits on their homeowners insurance. Sorry, if you don't mind, just summarize. Yes, I'm just doing these two last bullet points. Um, people with low limits on their homeowners insurance would receive insurance appraisals essentially showing they maxed their policies at a few thousand dollars with no specification of their actual loss beyond the maximum of the policy. And then these low appraisals would be misinterpreted as showing their actual loss and creating a ceiling inappropriately limiting their compensation. Okay, let's and, yeah. take this uh, testimony reading and we leave as it is and we move to the next one. Thank you. Let's keep in to is that, you know, we have to accommodate the other time. Uh, Adam Roberts. Uh, Tyler Tava. Is this on? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Tyler Taba. I'm a fellow with the Waterfront Alliance, the leader in waterfront revitalization, climate resilience, and advocacy for the New York, New Jersey Harbor region. The Waterfront Alliance is committed to sustainability and to mitigating the effects of climate change across the region's hundreds of miles of waterfront. We've spearheaded the Rise to Resilience Coalition of 100 plus groups advocating for policy related to climate resilience, and we run the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines Program for promoting innovation in climate design. Recent storms, particularly Ida, demonstrated the importance of resilience across the boroughs, and we urge the next mayor to expedite the forthcoming climate adaptation roadmap. While large-scale government-led infrastructure upgrades are in dire need, the city also requires a network of smaller-scale solutions at the building and neighborhood level. New York City has options for small-scale interventions to retrofit buildings and properties for higher resiliency. At an individual level, Critical mechanical and electrical systems can be moved to higher floors and potential penetration points for water-like utility hookups can be sealed. Investments in green infrastructure at the building scale can reduce the burden on stormwater systems. There is substantial value in a citywide climate resilience retrofit incentive program to facilitate meaningful, scale at, meaningful change at scale. The city and state's climate responses must include incentives, grants, and loans that support resilience retrofitting by property owners. And this incentive program has precedent with the recent enacting of Local Law 97. Addressing environmental injustices and past disinvestments should be central to any program's funding structure to ensure protection in the most vulnerable communities. We also call for the mayor to immediately commit resources to the New York City Department of Environmental Protection and the Office of Emergency Management to ensure not one more New Yorker is caught and killed by floodwaters in their own home. 
prioritize funding for a comprehensive citywide initiative to expand drain capacity throughout the city to prevent flooding, starting with building out storms, stormwater sewers or retention tanks in vulnerable areas with limited drainage systems. More immediate actions on implementing city infrastructure for greener and more sustainable solutions such as blue belt systems are essential. And finally, we call on the mayor to create a public information campaign for homeowners on flood insurance enrollment and to expand communication to New Yorkers about flood insurance through advertising on subway, bus, and ferry routes as insurance rates are likely to go up once FEMA updates their currently out of date flood maps. Thank, Thank you. you. Chris Bellavery. Sure. Hello, my name is Chris Bellavery. I'm a staff attorney with Riverkeeper. Uh, thank you for holding this meeting and thank you for inviting us. Um, Riverkeeper is a member supported watchdog organization dedicated to the protection and restoration of the Hudson River from source to sea, working with and advocating for communities throughout the region and safeguarding the drinking water supply for over 10 million residents of New York City in the Hudson River Valley. New York City and, the, and communities throughout the watersheds in the Hudson River and the New York water, City water supply are grappling with how climate change is reshaping the flood risks in multiple ways. I mean, basically the standard 100-year storm is, is the storm that has a 1% chance of happening on any given year. Well, what we have defined as, as the 100-year storm clearly occurs more than 1% of the time, and what actually is a 100-year storm is much more intense than what we have de designed for. Um, similarly, our floodplains are, have the same, the same issue. Um, and as long as humans continue making climate change worse, these are going to remain moving targets, which makes this a difficult thing to plan for. Um, Riverkeeper en encourages the city and MTA to keep some following principles in mind. Um, first one is developing holistic solutions based on all possible forms of flood risk. And the reason for that is there's, there's multiple forms of flooding that the city exper experiences. Obviously, the, uh, um, uh, the overwhelmed drainage system is the one that is most present at the moment, but there's also groundwater flooding, as MTA was talking about, riverine flooding, tidal flooding, and flooding from coastal storm surges. They all have different qualities and solutions that are only designed to address one of those can be counter counterproductive for other forms of flooding. And so that's why we're advocating that all forms of flooding are considered at the same time. Um, just as a simple, simple example, drainage systems that are designed to get water out of, a, out of a city if they don't have backflow preventers, obviously it can allow storm surge and other, other water just to be brought into the city as well. Um, uh, other principles that, that wanted to touch on was that there is going to be certainly some sort of thought about how you cannot upgraded the entire city's stormwater systems all at the same time. And so there should be some thought about, about how, essentially where it might be preferable to have planned shutdowns rather than form, forced shutdowns and how to sequence those. Also, considering that there are disadvantaged communities in the process, obviously we don't want to exasperate, exasperate that. So that's, okay. so, um, uh, uh, Basically, the other, one of the other things is uh, basically designing um, flood protection designs that are multi-layered, flexible components with, its, with adaptability and resilience because the climate is changing in ways that we don't, there are ways that we know and ways that we don't know. Um, and the, another thought was that the systems need to be designed for the city to not just survive, but thrive. And so we need to be looking at all the si side benefits, side problems and co-benefits of the various plans. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, Carlos Castel Croak. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castel Croak, and I am the associate for New York City programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. I want to thank all the chairs who are here today and the council members. Um, when Hurricane Ida hit our city a few weeks ago, our subway system was devastated. Almost every line was affected, stranding New Yorkers and disrupting commuters. A deadly storm such as this should no longer come at a surprise. We've been saying for years now that climate change is here. We no longer have the luxury of time. If we want to prevent costly damages, keep our critical transit infrastructure running during disaster and continue to fight climate change in the process, we must invest heavily in resilient infrastructure now. This will involve cooperation and coordination between the MTA, NYC DOT, and NYC DEP. 
First and foremost, we must implement green infrastructure across New York, including by reclaiming a large portion of our roads as public pedestrian spaces. Green infrastructure will not only help to absorb rainwater and mitigate flooding, but also increase cooling and improve local air quality, as well as beautify our neighborhoods. Furthermore, greening and pedestrianizing our roads will cut down on congestion and cars, which are the number one contributor to greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. Initiatives such as these will be particularly important for environmental justice communities that often already lack green space and have high levels of air pollution. We must also upgrade our other forms of public transportation, such as our buses, to ensure that our network is robust and reliable. In order to fund these improvements, we need significant investments in the MTA's capital plan through federal programs like the Build Back Better Act and from local sources such as congestion pricing. We must also create a comprehensive fiber resiliency plan so we can efficiently implement these programs, not just to protect our coasts, but also to preserve our inland neighborhoods and communities. Public transit is one of our strongest weapons in the fight against climate change. It provides an affordable and sustainable way to get around while also giving New Yorkers an alternative to automobiles. However, we must ensure that our public transit networks and our streets are built to withstand the increased flooding and storms that climate change will, climate change will continue to bring. It will be short-sighted and irresponsible to allow the very thing public transit seeks to upend thwart its very operation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone, the, the chairman of the... Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to commend this panel. Uh, I've, uh, in my in the previous years at the council, I've really enjoyed working with all of your um, organizations, and I feel that uh, this last panel has been among the most enlightening that we've had all day and I appreciate your continued advocacy. I hope the mayor's office, I don't think anyone here is here from the Office of uh, Legislative Affairs, but I can only hope that they're watching this uh, over the stream uh, so that they get the benefit uh, of your good views. And um, uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, at any time I have the, your good testimony here, and I look forward to working with all of you as I um, now that I'm back as chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection, so I appreciate you all being here very much. Thank you, Chair. So I'd like to thank the two other committees and the chairman for being part of this joint hearing of our Committee of Transportation, all the advocates. Uh, as we will finish in this hearing, if anyone from the audience wants to follow in another panel that we had this afternoon led by the sitting stage, and that's why I had to close on this one to move to the other one, even though it's not a city council hearing, but there's a panel going on about the future of housing, but also the future of transportation organized by sitting state. So I'm sorry for rushing a little bit, but it's about being able to move to the new responsibility too. And with that, uh, thank you to everyone, and, they, and this hearing is adjourned.